Chapter 20 of The Courage of Marjo Dune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Courage of Marjo Dune by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter 20. He thought of her words a long time after she had fallen asleep. Even in that last moment of her consciousness, he had found her voice filled with a strange faith and a wonderful assurance as it had drifted away in a whisper. He would not want the picture any more, because he had her. That was what she had said, and he knew it was her soul that had spoken to him as she had hovered that instant between consciousness and slumber. He looked at her, sleeping under his eyes, and he felt upon him for the first time the weight of a sudden trouble, a gloomy foreboding. And yet, under it all, like a fire banked beneath dead ash, was the warm thrill of his possession. He had spread his blanket over her, and now he leaned over and drew back her thick curls. They were warm and soft in his fingers, strangely sweet to touch, and for a moment or two he fondled them while he gazed steadily into the childish loveliness of her face, dimpled still by that shadow of a smile with which she had fallen asleep. He was beginning to feel that he had accepted for himself a tremendous task, and that she, not much more than a child, had of course scarcely foreseen its possibilities. Her faith in him was a pleasurable thing. It was absolute. He realized it more as the hours dragged on, and he sat alone by the fire. So great was it that she was going back fearlessly to those whom she hated and feared. She was returning not only fearlessly, but with a certain defiant satisfaction. He could fancy her saying to Hawk, and the red brute, I've come back. Now touch me if you dare. What would he have to do to live up to that surety of her confidence in him? A great deal, undoubtedly. And if he won for her, as she fully expected him to win, what would he do with her? Take her to the coast? Put her into a school somewhere down south? That was his first notion. For to him, she looked more than ever like a child as she lay asleep on her bed of balsams. He tried to picture Brokaw. He tried to see Hawk in his mental vision, and he thought over again all that the girl had told him about herself and these men. As he looked at her now, a little, softly breathing thing under his gray blanket, it was hard for him to believe anything so horrible as she had suggested. Perhaps her fears had been grossly exaggerated. The exchange of gold between Hawk and the Red Brute had probably been for something else. Even men engulfed in the brutality of the trade they were in would not think of such an appalling crime. And then, with a fierceness that made his blood boil, came the thought of that time when Broca had caught her in his arms and had held her head back until it hurt, and had kissed her. Barry had crept between his knees, and David's fingers closed so tightly on the loose skin of his neck that the dog whined. He rose to his feet and stood gazing down at the girl. He stood there for a long time, without moving or making a sound. A little woman, he whispered to himself at last. Not a child. From that moment, his blood was hot with a desire to reach the nest. He had never thought seriously of physical struggle with men, except in the way of sport. His disposition 
had always been to regard such a thing as barbarous, and he had never taken advantage of his skill with the gloves, as the average man might very probably have done. To fight was to lower one's self-respect enormously, he thought. It was not a matter of timidity, but of very strong conviction. An entrenchment that had saved him from wreaking vengeance in the hour when another man would have killed. But there, in that room in his home, he had stood face to face with a black, revolting sin. There had been nothing left to shield, nothing to protect. Here, it was different. A soul had given itself into his protection, a soul as pure as the star shining over the mountain tops and its little keeper lay there under his eyes, sleeping in the sweet faith that it was safe with him. A little later, his fingers tingled with an odd thrill as he took his automatic out of his pack, loaded it carefully, and placed it in his pocket where it could easily be reached. The act was a declaration of something ultimately definite. He stretched himself out near the fire, and went to sleep with the force of this declaration brewing strangely within him. He was awake with the summer dawn, and the sun was beginning to tint up the big red mountain when they began the descent into the valley. Before they started, he loaned the girl his comb and single military brush, and for fifteen minutes sat watching her while she brushed the tangles out of her hair until it fell about her in a thick, waving splendor. At the nape of her neck she tied it with a bit of string which she found for her, and after that, as they traveled downward, he observed how the rebellious tresses, shimmering and dancing about her, persisted in forming themselves into curls again. In an hour they reached the valley, and for a few moments they sat down to rest, while Tara foraged among the rocks for marmots. It was a wonderful valley into which they had come. From where they sat, it was like an immense park. Green slopes reached almost to the summits of the mountains, and to a point halfway up these slopes, the last timber line, clumps of spruce and balsam trees were scattered over the green as if set there by hands of men. Some of these timber patches were no larger than the decorative clumps in a city park, and others covered acres and tens of acres, and at the foot of the slopes on either side, like decorative fringes, were thin and unbroken lines of forest. Between these two lines of forest lay the open valley of soft and undulating meadow dotted with its purplish bosks of buffalo, willow, and mountain sage, its green coppices of wild rose and thorn, and its clumps of trees. In the hollow of the valley ran a stream. And this was her home. She was telling him about it as they sat there, and he listened to her, and watched her bird-like movements, without breaking in to ask questions which the knight had shaped in his mind. She pointed out gray summits on which she had stood. Off there, just visible in the gray mist of early sunshine, was the mountain where she had found Tara five years ago, a tiny cub who must have lost his mother. Perhaps the Indians had killed her. And that long, rock-strewn slide, so steep in places that he shuddered when he thought of what she had done, was where she and Tara had climbed over the range in their flight. She chose the rocks so that Tara would leave no trail. He regarded that slide as conclusive evidence of the very definite resolution that must have inspired her. A fit of girlish temper would not have taken her up that rock slide, and in the night. He thought it time to speak of what was weighing upon his mind. 
Listen to me, Marge, he said, pointing toward the red mountain ahead of them. Off there, you say, is the nest. What are we going to do when we arrive there? The little lines gathered between her eyes again as she looked at him. Why, tell them, she said. Tell them what? That you've come for me, and that we're going away, Sakewawin. And if they object, if Broca and Hawk say you cannot go, we'll go anyway, Sakewawin. That's a pretty name you've given me, he mused, thinking of something else. I like it. For the first time she blushed, blushed until her face was like one of the wild roses in those prickly copses of the valley. And then he added, You must not tell them too much, at first, Marge. Remember that you were lost, and I found you. You must give me time to get acquainted with Hawk and Brokaw. She nodded, but there was a moment's anxiety in her eyes, and he saw for an instant the slightest quiver in her throat. You won't let them keep me? No matter what they say, you won't let them keep me? He jumped up with a laugh and tilted her chin so that he looted straight into her eyes and her faith filled them again in a flood. No, you're going with me, he promised. Come, I'm quite anxious to meet Hawk and the Red Brute. It seemed singular to David that they met no one in this valley that day, and the girl's explanation that practically all travel came from the north and west and stopped at the nest did not fully satisfy him. He still wondered why they did not encounter one of the searching parties that must have been sent out for her, until she told him that, since Nisakus died, she and Tara had gone quite frequently into the mountains and remained all night, so that perhaps no search had been made for her after all. Hawk had not seemed to care. More frequently than otherwise, he had not missed her, Twice she had been away for two nights and two days. It was only because Brokaw had given that gold to Hawk that she feared pursuit. If Hawk had bought her. She spoke of that possible sale as if she might have been the merest sort of chattel. And then she startled him by saying, I have known of those white men from the north buying Indian girls. I have seen them sold for whiskey. Ugh! She shuddered. Nisikus and I overheard them one night. Hawk was selling a girl for a little sack of gold. Like that. Nisikus held me more tightly than ever that night. I don't know why. She was terribly afraid of that man. Hawk. Why did she live with him if she was afraid of him? Do you know? I wouldn't. I'd run away. He shook his head. I'm afraid I can't tell you, my child. Her eyes turned on him suddenly. Why do you call me that? A child? Because you're not a woman. Because you're so very, very young. And I'm so very old, he laughed. For a long time after that, she was silent as they traveled steadily toward the Red Mountain. They ate their dinner in the somber shadow of it. Most of the afternoon, Marge rode her bear. It was sundown when they stopped for their last meal. The nest was still three miles farther on, and the stars were shining brilliantly before they came to the little, wooded plain in the edge of which Hawk had hidden away his place of trade. When they were some hundred yards away, they came over a knoll, and David saw the glow of fires. The girl stopped suddenly, and her hand caught his arm. 
he counted four of those fires in the open. A fifth glowed faintly, as if back in timber. Sounds came to them. The slow, hollow booming of a tom-tom, and voices. They could see shadows moving. The girl's fingers were pinching David's arm. The Indians have come in, she whispered. There was a thrill of uneasiness in her words. It was not fear. He could see that she was puzzled, and that she had not expected to find fires, or those moving shadows. Her eyes were steady and shining as she looked at him. It seemed to him that she had grown taller, and more like a woman, as they stood there. Something in her face made him ask, Why have they come? I don't know, she said. She started down the knoll straight for the fires. Tara and Barry filed behind them. Beyond the glow of the camp, a dark bulk took shape against the blackness of the forest. David guessed that it was the nest. He made out a deep, low building, unlighted so far as he could see. Then they entered into the fire glow. Their appearance produced a strange and instant quiet. The beating of the tom-tom ceased. Voices died. Dark faces stared. And that was all. There were about fifty of them about the fires, David figured. And not a white man's face among them. They were all Indians. A lean, night-eyed, sinister-looking lot. He was conscious that they were scrutinizing him more than they were the girl. He could almost feel the prick of their eyes. With her head up, his companion walked between the fires and beyond them, looking neither to one side nor the other. They turned the end of the huge log building, and on this side it was glowing dimly with light, and David faintly heard voices. The girl passed swiftly into a hollow of gloom, calling softly to Tara. The bear followed her, a grotesque, slow-moving hulk, and David waited. He heard the clink of a chain. A moment later, she returned to him. There is a light in Hawk's room, she said. His council room, he calls it, where he makes bargains. I hope they are both there, Sakewawin, both Hawk and Brokaw. She seized his hand and held it tightly as she led him deeper into darkness. I wonder why so many of the Indians are in. I did not know they were coming. It is the wrong time of year for a crowd like that. He felt the quiver in her voice. She was quite excited, he knew, and yet not about the Indians, nor the strangeness of their presence. It was her triumph that made her tremble in the darkness, a wonderful anticipation of the greatest event that had ever happened in her life. She hoped that Hawk and Brokaw were in that room. She would confront them there with him. That was it. She felt her bondage, her imprisonment, in this savage place was ended, and she was eager to find them, and let them know that she was no longer afraid, or alone, no longer need obey or fear them. He felt the thrill of it in the hot, fierce little clasp of her hand. He saw it glowing in their eyes when they passed through the light of a window. Then they turned again, at the back of the building. They paused at a door. Not a ray of light broke the gloom here. The stars seemed to make the blackness deeper. Her fingers tightened. You must be careful, he said, and remember. I will, she whispered. It was his last warning. 
the door opened slowly, with a creaking sound, and they entered into a long, gloomy hall, illumined by a single oil lamp that sputtered and smoked in its bracket on one of the walls. The hall gave him an idea of the immensity of the building. From the far end of it, through a partly open door, came a reek of tobacco smoke and loud voices, a burst of coarse laughter, a sudden volley of curses that died away in a still louder roar of merriment. Someone closed the door from within. The girl was staring toward the end of the hall and shuddering. That is the way it has been, growing worse and worse since Nisikus died, she said. In there, the white men who come down from the north drink and gamble and quarrel. They are always quarreling. This room is ours, Nisikus in mind. She touched with her hand a door near which they were standing. Then she pointed to another. There were half a dozen doors up and down the hall. And that is Hawks. He threw off his pack, placed it on the floor, with his rifle across it. When he straightened, the girl was listening at the door of Hawks' room. Beckoning to him, she knocked on it lightly, and then opened it. David entered close behind her. It was a rather large room. His one impression as he crossed the threshold. In the center of it was a table, and over the table hung an oil lamp with a tin reflector. In the light of this lamp sat two men. In his first glance, he made up his mind which was Hawk and which was Brokaw. It was Brokaw, he thought, who was facing them as they entered. A man he could hate, even if he had never heard of him before. Big, loose-shouldered, a carnivorous-looking giant with a mottled, reddish face and bleary eyes that had an amazed and watery stare in them. Apparently, the girl's knock had not been heard, for it was a moment before the other man swung slowly about in his chair so that he could see them. That was Hawk. David knew it. He was almost a half smaller than the other, with round, bullish shoulders, a thick neck, and eyes wherein might lurk an incredible cruelty. He popped half out of his seat when he saw the girl and the stranger. His jaws seemed to tighten with a snap, a snap that could almost be heard. But it was Brokaw's face that held David's eyes. He was two-thirds drunk. There was no doubt about it. If he was any sort of judge of that kind of imbecility. One of his thick, huge hands was gripping a bottle. Hawk had evidently been reading him something out of a ledger, a post-ledger, which he held now in one hand. David was surprised at the quiet and unemotional way in which the girl began speaking. She said that she had wandered over into the other valley and was lost when this stranger found her. He had been good to her and was on his way to the settlement on the coast. His name was... She got no further than that. Brokaw had taken his devouring gaze from her and was staring at David. He lurched suddenly to his feet and leaned over the table, a new sort of surprise in his heavy countenance. He stretched out a hand. His voice was a bellow. McKenna! He was speaking directly at David, calling him by name. There was as little doubt of that as of his drunkenness. There was also an unmistakable note of fellowship in his voice. McKenna! David opened his mouth to correct him 
when a second thought occurred to him in a mildly inspirational way. Why not McKenna? The girl was looking at him, a bit surprised, questioning him in the directness of her gaze. He nodded and smiled at Brokaw. The giant came around the table, still holding out his big red hand. Mac, God, you don't mean to say you've forgotten. David took the hand. Brokaw, he chanced. The other's hand was as cold as a piece of beef. But it possessed a crushing strength. Hawk was staring from one to the other, and suddenly Brokaw turned to him, still pumping David's hand. McKenna, that young devil of kicking horse, Hawk, you've heard me speak of him, McKenna. The girl had backed to the door. She was pale. Her eyes were shining, and she was looking straight at David when Brokaw released his hand. Good night, Sakewawin, she said. It was very distinct, that word, Sakewawin. David had never heard it come quite so clearly from her lips. There was something of defiance and pride in her utterance of it, and intentional and decisive emphasis to it. She smiled at him as she went through the door, and in that same breath, Hawk had followed her. They disappeared. When David turned, he found Brokaw backed against the table, his hands gripping the edge of it, his face distorted by passion. It was a terrible face to look into, to stand before, alone in that room, a face filled with menace and murder. So sudden had been the change in it that David was stunned for a moment. In that space of perhaps a quarter of a minute, neither uttered a sound. Then Brokaw leaned slowly forward, his great hands clenched, and demanded in a hissing voice, What did she mean when she called you that? Sakewawin. What did she mean? It was now not the voice of a drunken man, but the voice of a man ready to kill. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Courage of Marge O'Doon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Courage of Marge O'Doon by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty One. Saki Wawan, what did she mean when she called you that? It was Brokaw's voice again, turning the words round but repeating them. He made a step toward David, his hands clenched more tightly and his whole hulk growing tense, his eyes blazing as if through a very thin film of water, water that seemed to cling there by some strange magic, were horrible. David thought Sakiwawin, a pretty name for himself, he had told the girl, and here it was raising the very devil with this drink-bloated colossus. He guessed quickly. It was decidedly a matter of guessing quickly and of making prompt and satisfactory explanation, or a throttling where he stood. His mind worked like a racehorse. Sakiwawin, meant something that had enraged Brokaw, a jealous rage, a rage that had filled his aqueous eyes with a lurid glare. So David said, looking into them calmly and with a little feigned surprise, wasn't she speaking to you, Brokaw? It was a splendid shot. David scarcely knew why he made it, except that he was moved by a powerful impulse which just now he had not time to analyze. It was this same impulse that had kept him from revealing himself when Brokaw had mistaken him for someone else. 
chance had thrown a course of action into his way and he had accepted it almost involuntarily. It had suddenly occurred to him that he would give much to be alone with this half-drunken man for a few hours, as McKenna. He might last long enough in that disguise to discover things, but not with Hayuk watching him. For Hayuk was four-fifths sober, and there was a depth to his cruel eyes which he did not like. He watched the effects of his words on Brokaw. The tenseness left his body, his hands unclenched slowly, his heavy jaw relaxed, and David laughed softly. He felt that he was out of deep water now. This fellow, half filled with drink, was wonderfully credulous, and he was sure that his watery eyes could not see very well, though his ears had heard distinctly. She was looking at you, Brokaw, straight at you, when she said good night he added. You sure? Sure she said it to me, Mac? David nodded, even as his blood ran a little cold. A leering grin of joy spread over Brokaw's face. The, the little devil, he said gloatingly. What does it mean? David asked. Sakiwawan. I had never heard it. He lied calmly, turning his head a bit out of the light. Brokaw stared at him a moment before answering. When a girl says that, it means she belongs to you, he said. In Indian, it means possession. Damn, of course you're right, she said it to me. She's mine. She belongs to me. I own her. And I thought... He caught up the bottle and turned out half a glass of liquor, swaying unsteadily. Drink back? David shook his head. Not now. Let's go to your shack if you've got one. Lots to talk about. Old times. Kicking horse, you know. And this girl. I can't believe it. If it's true, you're a lucky dog. He was not thinking of consequences. Of tomorrow. Tonight was all he asked for. Alone with Brokaw. That mountain of flesh, stupefied with liquor, was no match for him now. Tomorrow he might hold the whip hand if Hayuk did not return too soon. Lucky dog, lucky dog. He kept repeating that. It was like music in Brokaw's ears. And such a girl, an angel. He couldn't believe it. Brokaw's face was like a red fire in his exultation. His lustful joy, his great triumph. He drank the liquor he had proffered David and drank a second time, rumbling in his thick chest like some kind of animal. Of course she was an angel, hadn't he, and Hayuk, and that woman who had died made her grow into an angel? Just for him? She belonged to him, always had belonged to him, and he had waited a long time. If she had ever called any other man that name Sakiwawan, he would have killed him, certain, killed him dead. This was the first time she had ever called him that lucky dog. You bet he was. They'd go to his shack and talk. He drank a third time. He rolled heavily as they entered the hall, David praying that they would not meet Hayuk. He had his victim. He was sure of him, and the hall was empty. He picked up his gun and pack and held to Brokaw's arm as they went out into the night. Brokaw staggered guidingly into a wall of darkness, talking thickly about lucky dogs. They had gone perhaps a hundred paces when he stopped suddenly, very close to something that looked to David like a section of tall fence built of small trees. It was the cage. He jumped at that conclusion before he could see it clearly in the clouded starlight. From it there came a growling rumble, a deep breath that was like air escaping from a pair of bellows, and he saw faintly a huge, motionless shape beyond the stripped and upright sapling trunks. Grizzly, said Brokaw, trying to keep himself on an even balance. Big bear fight tomorrow. Mac, my bear her bear. A great fight. Everybody in to see it. Nothing like a bear fight, eh? Surprise her, won't it? 
pretty little wench. When she sees her bear fighting mine, bet you a hundred dollars my bear kills Tara. Tomorrow, said David, I'll bet tomorrow. Where's the shack? He was anxious to reach that, and he hoped it was a good distance away. He feared every moment that he would hear Hayuk's voice or his footsteps behind them, and he knew that Hayuk's presence would spoil everything. Brokaw, in his cups, was talkative, almost garrulous. Already he had explained the mystery of the cage and the Indians. The big fight was to take place in the cage, and the Indians had come in to see it. He found himself wondering, as they went through the darkness, how it had all been kept from the girl, and why Brokaw should deliberately lower himself still more in her esteem by allowing the combat to occur. He asked him about it when they entered the shack to which Brokaw guided him, and after they had lighted a lamp. It was a small, gloomy, whiskey-smelling place. Brokaw went directly to a box nailed against the wall and returned with a quart flask that resembled an army canteen and two tin cups. He sat down at a small table, his bloated red face in the light of the lamp, that queer animal-like rumbling in his throat as he turned out the liquor. David had heard porcupines make something like the same sound. He pulled his hat lower over his eyes to hide the gleam of them as Brokaw told him what he and Hayuk had planned. The bear in the cage belonged to him, Brokaw. A big brute, fierce, a fighter. Hayuk and he were going to bet on his bear because it would surely kill Tara. Make a big clean-up, they would. Tara was soft, too easy living, and they needed money because those scoundrels over on the coast had failed to get in enough whiskey for their trade. The girl had almost spoiled their plans by going away with Tara, and he, Mac, was a devil of a good fellow for bringing her back. They'd pull off the fight tomorrow, if the girl, that little bird devil that belonged to him, didn't like it. He brought the canteen down with a bang and shoved one of the cups across to David. Of course she belongs to you, said David, encouragingly. But, confound you, I can't believe it, you old dog. I can't believe it. He leaned over and gave Brokaw a jocular slap, forcing a laugh out of himself. She's too pretty for you. Prettiest kid I ever saw. How did it happen, eh? You lucky dog. He was fairly trembling as he saw the red fire of satisfaction, of gloating pleasure, deepen in Brokaw's face. She hasn't belonged to you very long, eh? Long time, long time, replied Brokaw, pausing with his cup halfway to his mouth, years ago. Suddenly he lowered the cup so forcefully that half the liquor in it was spilled over the table. He thrust his huge shoulders and red face toward David, and in an instant there was a snarl on his thick lips. Hayuk said she didn't, he growled. What do you think of that, Mac? Says she didn't belong to me any more, and I'd have to pay for her keep. God, I did. I gave him a lot of gold. You were a fool, said David, trying to choke back his eagerness. A fool. I should have killed him, shouldn't I, Mac? Killed him and took her, cried Brokaw huskily, his passion rising as he nodded his huge fists on the table. Killed him like you killed the breed for that long-haired she-devil over at Copper Cliff. I don't know, said David slowly, praying that he might not say the wrong thing now. I don't know what you claim you had on her. Brokaw, if I knew... He waited. Brokaw did not seem altogether like a drunken man now, and for a moment he feared that discovery had come. He leaned over the table. The watery film seemed to drop from his eyes for an instant, and his teeth gleamed wolfishly. David was glad the lamp chimney was black with soot and that the rim of his hat shadowed his face, for it seemed to him that 
Brokaw's vision had grown suddenly better. I should have killed him and took her, repeated Brokaw, his voice heavy with passion. I should have had her long ago, but Hayuk's woman kept her from me. She's been mine all along, ever since. His mind seemed to lag. He drew his hulking shoulders back slowly. But I'll have her tomorrow, he mumbled, as if he had suddenly forgotten David and was talking to himself. Tomorrow, next day we'll start north. Hayuk can't say anything now. I've paid him. She's mine. Mine now. Tonight. Bye. David shuddered at what he saw in the brute's revolting face. It was the dawning of a sudden terrible idea. Tonight. It blazed there in his eyes, growing watery again. Quickly David turned out more liquor and thrust one of the cups into Brokaw's hand. The giant drank. His body sank into the piggish laxness. For a moment the danger was past. David knew that time was precious. He must force his hand. And if Hayuk troubles you, he cried, striking the table a blow with his fist, I'll help you settle for him. Brokaw, I'll do it for old time's sake. I'll do to him what I did to the breed. The girl is yours. She's belonged to you for a long time, eh? Tell me about it, Brokaw. Tell me it before Hayuk comes. Could he never make that bloated fiend tell him what he wanted to know? Brokaw stared at him stupidly, and then all at once he started, as if someone had pricked him into consciousness, and a slow grin began to spread over his face. It was a reminiscent, horrible sort of leer, not a smile, the expression of a man who gloats over a, a revolting and unspeakable thing. She's mine, been mine ever since she was a baby, he confided, leaning again over the table. Good friend, give her to me, Mac, good friend but a damn fool, he chuckled. He rubbed his huge hands together and turned out more liquor. Damn fool, he repeated. Any man's a damn fool to turn down a pretty woman, eh, Mac? And she's was pretty, he says. My girl's mother, you know. She must have been pretty. It was off there in the bush country years ago. The kid you brought in today was a baby then, alone with her mother. Ho, ho, deuce easy deuce easy, but he was a darn fool. He drank with incredible slowness, it seemed to David. It was torture to watch him, with the fear, every instant, that Hayuk would come. What happened, he urged. Bucky, my friend, in love with that woman, Odoon's wife, resumed Brokaw. Dead crazy, Mac. Crazier than you were over the breed's woman, only he didn't have the nerve just moped around, waiting, keeping out of Odoon's way. Trapper Odoon was, or a company runner. Forgot which. Anyway, he went on a long trip in winter and got laid up with a broken leg long way from home. Wife and baby alone, and Bucky sneaked up one day and found the woman sick with fever. Out of her head, dead out, Bucky says. And my God, if she didn't think he was her husband come back, that's easy, Mac, and he lacked the nerve. Crazy in love with her, he was, and didn't dare play the part. Told me it was conscience. Bah, it wasn't. He was afraid, scared, a fool. Then he said the fever must have touched him. Ho, ho, it was funny. He was a scared fool. Wish I'd been there, Mac. Wish I had. His eyes half-closed, gleaming in narrow, shining slits. His chin dropped on his chest. David prodded him on. Bucky got her to run away with him, continued Brokaw. Her and the kid, while she was still out of her head. Bucky even got her to write a note, he said, telling Odoon she was sick of him and was running away with another man. Bucky didn't give his own name, of course and the woman didn't know what she was doing. They started west with the kid, and all the time Bucky was afraid. He dragged the woman on a sledge, and the snow covered their trail. 
He hid in a cabin a hundred miles from Odoon's, and it was there the woman came to her senses. God, it must have been exciting. Bucky says she was like a mad woman, and that she ran screeching out into the night, leaving the kid with him. He followed, but he couldn't find her. He waited, but she never came back. A snowstorm covered her trail. Then Bucky said he went mad, the fool. He waited till spring, keeping that kid, and then he made up his mind to get it back to Papa Odoon in some way. He sneaked back where the cabin had been and found nothing but char there. It had been burned. Oh, the devil, but it was funny, and after all this trouble he hadn't dared to take Odoon's place with the woman. Conscience? Bah, he was a fool. You don't get a pretty woman like that very often, eh, Mac? Unsteadily he tilted the flask to turn himself out another drink. His voice was thickening. David rejoiced when he saw that the flask was empty. Damn, said Brokaw, shaking it. Go on, insisted David. You haven't told me how you came by the girl, Brokaw. The watery film was growing thicker over Brokaw's eyes. He brought himself back to his story with an apparent effort. Came west, Bucky did, with the kid, he went on. Struck my cabin on the Mackenzie a year later. Told me all about it. Then one day he sneaked away and left her with me, begging me to put her where she'd be safe. I did. Gave her to Hayuk's woman and told her Bucky's story. Later, Hayuk came over here and built this place. Three years ago, I came down from the Yukon and saw the kid. Pretty, God, she was, almost a woman, and she was mine. I told him so. Maybe the woman would have cheated me, but I had Hayuk on the hip because I saw him kill a man when he was drunk. A white man from Fort McPherson helped him hide the body, and then... Oh, it was funny. I ran across Bucky. He was living in a shack a dozen miles from here, and he didn't know Marge was Odoon's baby. I told him a big lie, told him the kid died and that I'd heard the woman had killed herself and that Odoon was in a lunatic asylum. Maybe he did have a conscience, the fool. Guess he was little crazy himself. Went away soon after that. Never heard of him since, and I've been hanging around until the girl was old enough to live with a man. Ain't I done right, Mac? Don't she belong to me? And tomorrow? His head rolled. He recovered himself with an effort and leaned heavily against the table. His face was almost barren of human expression. It was the face of a monster, unlighted by reason, stripped of mind and soul and David, glaring into it across the table, questioned him once more, even as he heard the crunch of footsteps outside and knew that Hayek was coming, coming in all probability to unmask him in the part he had played. But Hayek was too late. He was ready to fight now, and as he held himself prepared for the struggle, he asked that question. And this man, Bucky, what was his other name, Brokaw? Brokaw's thick lips moved and then came his voice in a husky whisper. Tavish. End of chapter 21all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Courage of Marge O'Doon by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter 22. The next instant, Hayuk was at the open door. He did not cross the threshold at once, but stood there for perhaps twenty seconds. 
his gray, hard face looking in on them with eyes in which there was a cold and sinister glitter. Brokaw, with the fumes of liquor thick in his brain, tried to nod an invitation for him to enter. His head rolled grotesquely and his voice was a croak. David rose slowly to his feet, thrusting back his chair. From contemplating Brokaw's sagging body, Hayuk's eyes were leveled at him, and then his lips parted. One would not have called it a smile. It revealed to David a deadly animosity which the man was trying to hide under the disguise of that grin, and he knew that Hayuk had discovered that he was not McKenna. Swiftly David shot a glance at Brokaw. The giant's head and shoulders lay on the table, and he made a sudden daring effort to save a little more time for himself. I'm sorry, he said. He's terribly drunk. Hayuk nodded his head. He kept nodding it. That cold glitter in his eyes, the steady, insinuating grin still there. Yes, he's drunk, he said, his voice as hard as a rock. Better come to the house. I've got a room for you. There's only one bunk in here, McKenna. He dragged out the name slowly, a bit tauntingly it seemed to David, and David laughed. Might as well play his last card well, he thought. My name isn't McKenna, he said. It's David Rain. He made a mistake, and he's so drunk I haven't been able to explain. Without answering, Hayuk backed out of the door. It was an invitation for David to follow. Again he carried his pack and gun with him through the darkness, and Hayuk uttered not a word as they returned to the nest. The night was brighter now, and David could see Barry close at his heels, following him as silently as a shadow. The dogs slunk out of sight when they came to the building. They did not enter from the rear this time. Hayuk led the way to a door that opened into the big room from which had come the sound of cursing and laughter a little before. There were ten or a dozen men in that room, all white men, and, upon entering, David was moved by a sudden suspicion that they were expecting him, that Hayuk had prepared them for his appearance. There was no liquor in sight. If there had been bottles and glasses on the table, they had been cleared away, but no one had thought to wipe away certain liquid stains that David saw shimmering wetly in the glow of the three big lamps hanging from the ceiling. He looked the men over quickly as he followed the free trader. Never, he thought, had he seen a rougher or more unpleasant-looking lot. He caught more than one eye filled with the glittering menace he had seen in Hayuk's. Not a man nodded at him or spoke to him. He passed close to one raw-boned individual, so close that he brushed against him, and there was an unconcealed and threatening animosity in this man's face as he glared up at him. By the time he had passed through the room, his suspicion had become a conviction. Hayuk had purposely put him on parade, and there was a deep and sinister significance in the attitude of these men. They passed through the hall into which he and Marge had entered from the opposite side of the nest, and Hayuk paused at the door of the room almost opposite to the one which the girl had said belonged to her. This will be your room while you are our guest, he said. The glitter in his eyes softened as he nodded at David. He tried to speak a bit affably, but David felt that his effort was rather unsuccessful. It failed to cover the hard note in his voice and a curious twitch of his upper lip, a snarl almost, as he forced a smile. Make yourself at home, he added. We'll have breakfast in the morning with my niece. He paused for a moment and then said, looking keenly at David, I suppose you tried hard to make Brokaw understand he had made a mistake and that you wasn't McKenna. Brokaw is a good fellow when he isn't drunk. 
David was glad that he had turned away without waiting for an answer. He did not want to talk with Hayuk tonight. He wanted to turn over in his mind what he had learned from Brokaw, and tomorrow act with the cool judgment which was more or less characteristic of him. He did not believe even now that there would be anything melodramatic in the outcome of the affair. There would be an unpleasantness, of course, but when both Hayuk and Brokaw were confronted with a certain situation and with the peculiarly significant facts which he now held in his possession, he could not see how they would be able to place any very great obstacle in the way of his determination to take Marge from the nest. He did not think of the personal harm to himself, and as he entered his room, where a lamp had been lighted for him, his mind had already begun to work on a plan of action. He would compromise with them. In return for the loss of the girl, they should have his promise, his oath, if necessary, not to reveal the secret of the traffic in which they were engaged, or of that still more important affair between Hayuk and the white man from Fort Macpherson. He was certain that, in his drunkenness, Brokaw had spoken the truth, no matter what he might deny tomorrow. They would not hazard an investigation, though to lose the girl now, at the very threshold of his exultant realization, would be like taking the earth from under Brokaw's feet. In spite of the tenseness of the situation, David found himself chuckling with satisfaction. It would be unpleasant, very, he repeated that assurance to himself, but that self-preservation would be the first law of these rascals, he was equally positive and he began thinking of other things that just now were of more thrilling import to him. It was Tavish, then, that half-mad hermit in his mice-infested cabin, who had been at the bottom of it all, Tavish. The discovery did not amaze him profoundly. He had never been able to disassociate Tavish from the picture, unreasoning though he had confessed to himself to be, and now that his mildly impossible conjectures had suddenly developed into facts, he was not excited. It was another thought, or other thoughts, that stirred him more deeply and brought a heat into his blood. His mind leaped back to that scene of years ago, when Marge O'Doon's mother had run shrieking out into the storm of night to escape Tavish. But she had not died. That was the thought that burned in David's brain now. She had lived. She had searched for her husband, Michael O'Doon, a half-mad wanderer of the forests at first. She may have been. She had searched for years, and she was still searching for him when he had met her that night on the transcontinental. For it was she, Marge O'Doon, the mother, the wife, into whose dark, haunting eyes he had gazed from out of the sunlit depths of his own despair. Her mother, alive, seeking a Michael O'Doone, seeking, seeking. He was filled with a great desire to go at once to the girl and tell her this wonderful new fact that had come into her life, and he found himself suddenly at the door of his room, with his fingers on the latch, Standing there, he shrugged his shoulders, laughing softly at himself as he realized how absurdly sensational he was becoming all at once. Tomorrow would be the time. He filled and lighted his pipe, and in the whitish fumes of his tobacco he could picture quite easily the grey, dead face of Tavish hanging at the end of his meat rack pacing restlessly back and forth across his room he recalled the scenes of that night and of days and nights that had followed brokaw had given him the key that was unlocking door after door guess he was a little crazy brokaw had said speaking of tavish as he had last known him on the firepan crazy going mad and at last he had killed himself 
Was it possible that a man of Tavish's sort could be haunted for so long by spectres of the past? It seemed unreasonable. He thought of Father Roland and of the mysterious room in the chateau where he worshipped at the shrine of a woman and a child who were gone. He clenched his hands and stopped himself. What had leaped into his mind was as startling to his inner consciousness as the unexpected flash of magnesium in a dark room. It was unthinkable, impossible, and yet, following it, he found himself face to face with question after question which he made no effort to answer. He was dazed for a moment, as if by the terrific impact of a thing which had neither weight nor form. Tavish, the woman, the girl, Father Roland, absurd. He shook himself, literally shook himself, to get rid of that wildly impossible idea. He drove his mind back to the photograph of the girl and the woman. How had she come into possession of the picture which Brokaw had taken? What had Nisikus tried to say to Marge Odun in those last moments when she was dying? whispered words which the girl had not heard because she was crying and her heart was breaking. Did Nisikos know that the mother was alive? Had she sent the picture to her when she realized that the end of her own time was drawing near? There was something unreasonable in this too, but it was the only solution that came to him. He was still pacing his room when the creaking of the door stopped him. It was opening slowly and steadily, and apparently with extreme caution. In another moment, Marge O'Doon stood inside. He had not seen her face so white before. Her eyes were big and glowing darkly, pools of quivering fear, of wild and imploring supplication. She ran to him and clung to him with her hands at his shoulders, her face close to his. Sakiwawin, dear, Sakiwawin, we must go, we must hurry, tonight. She was trembling, fairly shivering against him, with one hand touching his face now, and he put his arms about her gently. What is it, child? he whispered, his heart choking suddenly. What has happened? We must run away, we must hurry. At the touch of his arm, she had relaxed against his breast. The last of her courage seemed gone. She was limp and terrified, and was looking up at him in such a strange way that he was filled with alarm. I didn't tell him anything, she whispered, as if afraid he would not believe her. I didn't tell him you weren't that man, Mac, McKenna. He heard you and Brokaw go when you passed my room. Then he went to the men. I followed and listened. I heard him telling them about you, that you were a spy, that you belonged to the provincial police. A sound in the hall interrupted her. She grew suddenly tense in his arms, then slipped from them and ran noiselessly to the door. There were shuffling steps outside, a thick voice growling unintelligibly. The sounds passed. Marge O'Doon was whiter still when she faced David. Hayuk and Brokaw, she stood there with her back to the door. We must hurry, Sakiwawin, we must go, tonight. David looked at her, a spy, police, quite the first thing for Hayuk to suspect, of course. That law of self-preservation again the same law that would compel them to give up the girl to him tomorrow. He found himself smiling at his frightened little companion, back there against the door, white as death. His calmness did not reassure her. He said, You were a spy, she repeated, as if he must understand what that meant. They wanted to follow you to Brokaw's cabin and, and kill you. This was coming to the bottom of her fear with a vengeance. It sent a mild sort of shiver through him and corroborated with rather disturbing emphasis what he had seen in the men's faces 
as he passed among them. And Hayuk wouldn't let them. Was that it? he asked. She nodded, clutching a hand at her throat. He told them to do nothing until he saw Brokaw. He wanted to be certain, and then... His amazing and smiling composure seemed to choke back the words on her lips. You must return to your room, Marge, he said quickly. Hayuk has now seen Brokaw, and there will be no trouble such as you fear. I can promise you that. Tomorrow we will leave the nest openly, and with Hayuk's and Brokaw's permission. But should they find you here now, in my room, I am quite sure we should have immediate trouble on our hands. I have a great deal to tell you, much that will make you glad, but I half expect another visit from Hayuk, and you must hurry to your room. He opened the door slightly and listened. Good night, he whispered, putting a hand for an instant to her hair. Good night, Sakiwawan. She hesitated for just a moment at the doors and then with the faintest sobbing breath, was gone. What wonderful eyes she had! How they had looked at him in that last moment! David's fingers were trembling a little as he locked his door. There was a small mirror on the table, and he held it up to look at himself. He regarded his reflection with grim amusement. He was not beautiful. The scrub of blonde beard on his face gave him a rather outlawish appearance, and the gray hair over his temples had grown quite conspicuous of late, quite conspicuous indeed. Heredity? Perhaps, but it was confoundly remindful of the fact that he was thirty-eight. He went to bed after placing the table against the door and his automatic under his pillow, absurd and unnecessary details of caution he assured himself and while marge o'doon sat awake close to the door of her room all night with a little rifle that had belonged to nisikus across her lap david slept soundly in the amazing confidence and philosophy of that perilous age thirty-eight end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of the Courage of Marge O'Doon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Courage of Marge O'Doon by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty Three. A series of sounds that came to him at first like the booming of distant cannon roused David from his slumber. He awoke to find broad day in his room and a knocking at his door. He began to dress, calling out that he would open it in a moment, and was careful to place the automatic in his pocket before he lifted the table without a sound to its former position in the room. When he flung open the door, he was surprised to find Brokaw standing there instead of Hawk. It was not the Brokaw of last night. A few hours had produced a remarkable change in the man. One would not have thought that he had been recently drunk. He was grinning and holding out one of his huge hands as he looked into David's face. "'Morning, Rain,' he greeted affably. "'Hawk sent me to wake you up for the fun. You got just time to swallow your breakfast before we put on the big scrap. Scrap I told you about last night when I was drunk. Head over heels drunk, wasn't I? Took you for a friend I knew, funny. You don't look a damn bit like him.' David shook hands with him. In his first astonishment, Brokaw's manner appeared to him to be quite sincere, and his voice to be filled with apology. This impression was gone before he had dropped his hand, and he knew why Hawk's partner had come. It was to get a good look at him, to make sure that he was not McKenna, and it was also with the strategic purpose of removing whatever suspicions David might have by an outward show of friendship. For this last bit of work, Brokaw was crudely out of place. His eyes, like a bad dog's, could not conceal what lay behind them. Hatred, a deep and intense desire to grip the throat of this man who had tricked him. 
and his grin was forced with a subdued sort of malevolence about it david smiled back you were drunk he said i had a deuce of a time trying to make you understand that i wasn't mckenna that amazing lie seemed for a moment to daze brokaw david realized the audacity of it and knew that brokaw would remember too well what had happened to believe him its effect was what he was after and if he had a doubt as to the motive of the other's visit that doubt disappeared almost as quickly as he had spoken the grin went out of brokaw's face his jaws tightened the red came near to the surface in the bloodshot eyes as plainly as if he were giving voice to his thought he was saying you lie but he kept back the words and as david noted carelessly the slow clenching and unclenching of his hands he believed that hawk was not very far away and that it was his warning and the fact that he was possibly listening to them that restrained brokaw from betraying himself completely as it was the grin returned slowly into his face hawk says he's sorry he couldn't have breakfast with you he said couldn't wait any longer the indian's going to bring your breakfast here you'd better hurry if you want to see the fun and with this he turned and walked heavily toward the end of the hall david glanced across at the door of marge's room it was closed and then he looked at his watch it was almost nine o'clock he felt like swearing as he thought of what he had missed that breakfast with hawk and the girl he would undoubtedly have had an opportunity of seeing hawk alone for a little while a quarter of an hour would have been enough or he could have settled the whole matter in marge's presence he wondered where she was now in her room approaching footsteps caused him to draw back deeper into his own and a moment later his promised breakfast appeared carried on a big company kiakon by an old indian woman undoubtedly the woman that marge had told him about she placed the huge plate on his table and withdrew without either looking at him or uttering a sound he ate hurriedly and finished dressing himself after that it was a quarter after nine when he went into the hall in passing marge's door he knocked there came no response from within he turned and passed through the big room in which he had seen so many unfriendly faces the night before it was empty now the stillness of the place began to fill him with uneasiness and he hurried out into the day a low tumult of sound was in the air unintelligible and yet thrilling a dozen steps brought him to the end of the building and he looked toward the cage for a space after that he stood without moving filled with a sudden sickening horror as he realized his helplessness in this moment if he had not overslept if he had talked with hawk he might have prevented this monstrous thing that was happening he might have demanded that tara be a part of their bargain it was too late now an excited and yet strangely quiet crowd was gathered about the cage a crowd so tense and motionless that he knew the battle was on a low growling roar came to him and again he heard that tumult of human voices like a great gasp rising spontaneously out of a half hundred throats and in response to the sound he gave a sudden cry of rage tara was already battling for his life tara that great big-souled brute who had learned to follow his little mistress like a protecting dog and who had accepted him as a friend tara grown soft and lazy and unwarlike because of his voluntary slavery had been offered to the sacrifice which brokaw had told him was inevitable and the girl where was she he was unconscious of the fact that his hand was gripping hard at the automatic in his pocket for a space his brain burned red seething with a physical passion a consuming anger which in all his life had never been roused so terrifically within him he rushed forward and took his place in the thin circle of watching men he did not look at their faces he did not know whether he stood next to white men or indians he did not see the blaze in their eyes the joyous trembling of their bodies their silent savage exultation in the spectacle he was looking at the cage it was twenty feet square built of small trees almost a foot in diameter with eighteen inch spaces between and out of it came a sickening grinding smash of jaws the two beasts were down a ton of flesh and bone in what seemed to him to be a death embrace 
For a moment he could not tell which was Tara and which was Brokaw's grizzly. They separated in that same breath, gained their feet, and stood facing each other. They must have been fighting for some minutes. Tara's jaws were foaming with blood, and out of the throat of Brokaw's bear there rolled a rumbling, snarling roar that was like a deep-chested bellow of an angry bull. With that roar they came together again, Tara waiting stolidly and with panting sides for the rush of his enemy. It was hard for David to see what was happening in that twisting contortion of huge bodies. But as they rolled heavily to one side, he saw a great red splash of blood where they had lain. It looked as if someone had poured it out there out of a pail. Suddenly a hand fell on his shoulder. He looked round. Brokaw was leering at him. Great scrap, eh? Huh? There was a look in his red face that revealed the pitiless savagery of a cat. David's clenched hand was as hard as iron, and his brain was filled with a wild desire to strike. He fought to hold himself in. Where is the girl? he demanded. Brokaw's face revealed his hatred now, the taunting triumph of his power over the man who was a spy. He bared his yellow teeth in an exultant grin. Tricked her, he snarled. Tricked her like you tricked me. Got the Indian woman to steal her clothes, and she's up there in her room alone and naked. And she won't have any clothes until I say so, for she's mine, body and soul. David's clenched hand shot out and in his blow was not alone the cumulated force of all his years of training, but also of the one great impulse he ever had to kill. In that instant he wanted to strike a man dead, a red-visaged monster, a fiend, and his blow sent Brokaw's huge body reeling backward, his head twisted as if his neck had been broken. He had not time to see what happened after that blow. He did not see Brokaw fall, a piercing interruption, a scream that startled every drop of blood in his body turned him toward the cage. Ten paces from him, standing at the inner edge of that circle of astounded and petrified men, was the girl. At first he thought she was standing naked there, naked under the staring eyes of the fiends about him. Her white arms gleamed bare, her shoulders and breast were bare, her slim satiny body was naked to the waist, about which she had drawn tightly, as if in a wild panic of haste, an old and ragged skirt. It was the Indian woman's skirt. He caught the glitter of beads on it, and for a moment he stared with the others, unable to move or cry out her name, and then a breath of wind flung back her hair, and he saw her face the color of marble. She was like a piece of glistening statuary, without a quiver of life that his eyes could see, without a movement, without a breath. Only her hair moved, stirred by the air, flooded by the sun, floating about her shoulders and down her bare back in a loosened cloud of red and gold fires. And out of this she was staring at the cage, stunned into that lifeless and unbreathing posture of horror by what she saw. David did not follow her eyes. He heard the growl and the roar and clashing jaws of the fighting beasts. They were down again. One of the six-inch trees that formed the bars of the cage snapped like a walking stick as their great bodies lurched against it. The earth shook. The very air seemed to tremble with the terrific force of that struggle. And only the girl was looking at that struggle. Every eye was on her now, and David sprang suddenly forth from the circle of men, calling her name. Ten paces separated them. Half that distance lay between the girl and the cage, with the swiftness of an arrow sprung from the bow she had leaped into life and crossed that space. In a tenth part of a second, David would have been at her side. He was that tenth of a second too late. A gleaming shaft she had passed between the bars, and a tumult of horrified voices rose above the roar of battle as the girl sprang at the beasts with her naked hands. Her voice came to David in a scream. Tara! 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 His brain reeled when he saw her down, down with her little fists pummeling at the great shaggy head, and in him there was the sickening weakness of a drunken man as he squeezed through that eighteen-inch aperture and almost fell at her side. He did not know that he had drawn his automatic. He scarcely realized that as fast as his fingers could press the trigger, he was firing shot after shot with the muzzle of his pistol so close to the head of Tara's enemy that the reports of the weapon were deadened as if muffled under a thick blanket. It was a heavy weapon. A stream of lead burned its way into the grizzly's brain. 
There were eleven shots, and he fired them all in that wild blood-red frenzy, and when he stood up, he had the girl close in his arms, her naked breast throbbing pantingly against him. The clasp of his hands against her warm flesh cleared his head, and while Taro was rending at the throat of his dying foe, David drew her swiftly out of the cage and flung about her the light jacket he had worn. Go to your room, he said. Tara is safe. I will see that no harm comes to him now. The cordon of men separated for them as he led her through. The crowd was so silent that they could hear Tara's low throat growling and then breaking that silence in a savage cry came brokaw's voice stop he faced them huge terrible quivering with rage a step behind him was hawk and there was no longer in his face an effort to conceal his murderous intentions close behind hawk there gathered quickly his white-faced whiskey mongers like a pack of wolves waiting for a lead cry david expected that cry to come from brokaw the girl expected it and she clung to David's shoulders, her bloodless face turned to the danger. It was Brokaw who gave the signal to the men. "'Clear out the cage!' he bellowed. "'This damned spy has killed my bear, and he's got to fight me. Do you understand? Clear out the cage!' He thrust his head and bull shoulders forward, until his foul, hot breath touched their faces, and his red neck was swollen like the neck of a cobra with the passion of his jealousy and hatred. And in that fight I'm going to kill you, he hissed. It was Hawk who put his hands on the girl. Go with him, whispered David, as his arms tightened about her shoulders. You must go with him, Marge, if I'm to have a chance. Her face was against him. She was talking low, swiftly, for his ears alone, with Hawk already beginning to pull her away. I will go to the house. When you see me at that window, fall on your face. I have a rifle. I will shoot him dead from the window. Perhaps Hawk heard. David wondered as he caught the glitter in his eyes when he drew the girl away. He heard the crash of the big gate to the cage, and Tara ambled out and took his way slowly and limpingly toward the edge of the forest. When he saw the girl again, he was standing in the center of the cage, his feet in a pool of blood that smeared the ground. She was struggling with Hawk, struggling to break away from him and get to the house. And now he knew that Hawk had heard, and that he would hold her there, and that her eyes would be on him while Brokaw was killing him. For he knew that Brokaw would fight to kill. It would not be a square fight. It would be murder if the chance came Brokaw's way. The thought did not frighten him. He was growing strangely calm in these moments. He realized the advantage of being unencumbered, and he stripped off his shirt and tightened his belt. And then Brokaw entered. The giant had stripped himself to the waist, and he stood for a moment looking at David, a monster with a lust of murder in his eyes. It was frightfully unequal, this combat. David felt it. He was blind if he did not see it. And yet he was still unafraid. A great silence fell. Cutting it like a knife came the girl's voice. Sekwawin! Sekwawin! A brutish growl rose out of Brokaw's chest. He had heard that cry, and it stung him like an asp. Tonight she'll be with me, he taunted David, and lowered his head for battle. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of the Courage of Marge O'Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Courage of Marge O'Doone by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty Four David no longer saw the horde of faces beyond the thick bars of the cage. His last glance, shot past the lowered head and hulking shoulders of his giant adversary, went to the girl. He noticed that she had ceased her struggling and was looking toward him. After that his eyes never left Brokaw's face. Until now it had not seemed that Brokaw was so big and so powerful, and sizing up his enemy in that moment, before the first rush, he realized that his one hope was to keep him from using his enormous strength at close quarters. A clinch would be fatal. 
In Brokaw's arms he would be helpless. He was conscious of an unpleasant thrill as he thought how easy it would be for the other to break his back or snap his neck if he gave him the opportunity. Science. What would it avail him here, pitted against this mountain of flesh and bone that looked as though it might stand the beating of clubs without being conquered? His first blow returned his confidence, even if it had wavered slightly. Brokaw rushed. It was an easy attack to evade, and David's arm shot out and his fist landed against Brokaw's head with a sound that was like the crack of a whip. Hawk would have gone down under that blow like a log. Brokaw staggered. Even he realized that this was science, the skill of the game, and he was grinning as he advanced again. He could stand a hundred blows like that, a grim and ferocious Achilles with but one vulnerable point, the end of his jaw. David waited and watched for his opportunity as he gave ground slowly. Twice they circled about the blood-splattered arena. Brokaw following him with leisurely sureness, and yet delaying his attack as if in that steady retreat of his victim he saw torture too satisfying to put an end to at once. David measured his carelessness, the slow, almost unguarded movement of his great body, his unpreparedness for a coup de main, and like a flash he launched himself forward with all the weight of his body behind his effort. It missed the other's jaw by two inches, that catapeltic blow, striking him full in the mouth, breaking his yellow teeth and smashing his thick lips so that the blood sprang out in a spray over his hairy chest. And as his head rocked backward, David followed with a swift left-hander, and a second time missed the jaw with his right, but drenched his clenched fist in blood. Out of Brokaw there came a cry that was like the low roar of a beast a cry that was the most inhuman sound David had ever heard from a human throat. And in an instant he found himself battling not for victory, not for that opportunity he twice had missed, but for his life. Against that rushing bulk, enraged almost to madness, the ingenuity of his training alone saved him from immediate extinction. How many times he struck in the one hundred and twenty seconds, following his blow to Brokaw's mouth, he could never have told. He was red with Brokaw's blood. His face was warm with it. His hands were as if painted, so often did they reach with right and left to Brokaw's gory visage. It was like striking at a monstrous thing without the sense of hurt, a fiend that had no brain, that blows could sicken, a body that was not a body, but an enormity that had strangely taken human form. Brokaw had struck him once, only once in those two minutes, but blows were not what he feared now. He was beating himself to pieces, literally beating himself to pieces as a ship might have hammered itself against a reef, and fighting with every breath to keep himself out of the fatal clinch. His efforts were costing him more than they were costing his antagonist. Twice he had reached his jaw. Twice Brokaw's head had rocked back on his shoulders, and then he was there again, closing in on him, grinning, dripping red to the soles of his feet, unconquerable. Was there no fairness out there beyond the bars of the cage? Were they all like the man he was fighting? Devils? An intermission, only half a minute, enough to give him a chance. The slow, invincible beast he was hammering almost had him as his thoughts wandered. He only half fended the sledge-like blow that came straight for his face. He ducked, swung up his guard like lightning, and was saved from death by a miracle. That blow would have crushed in his face, killed him. He knew it. Brokaw's huge fist landed against the side of his head and grazed off like a bullet that had struck the slanting surface of a rock. And yet the force of it was sufficient to send him crashing against the bars and down. In that moment he thanked God for Brokaw's slowness. He had a clear recollection afterward of almost having spoken the words as he lay dazed and helpless for an infinitesimal space of time. He expected Brokaw to end it there, but Brokaw stood, mopping the blood from his face, as if partly blinded by it, while from beyond the cage there came a swiftly growing rumble of voices. He heard a scream. It was the scream, the agonized cry of the girl, that brought him to his feet, while Brokaw was still wiping the hot flow from his dripping jaw. 
It was that cry that cleared his brain, that called out to him in its despair that he must win, that all was lost for her as well as for himself if he was vanquished. For more positively than at any other time during the fight, he felt now that defeat would mean death. It had come to him definitely in the savage outcry of joy when he was down. There was to be no mercy. He had read the ominous decree, and Brokaw, he was like a madman as he came toward him again. There was no longer the leer on his face. There was in his battered and swollen countenance but one emotion. Blood and hurt could not hide it. It blazed like fires in his half-closed eyes. It was the desire to kill. The passion which quenches itself in the taking of life, and every fiber in David's brain rose to meet it. He knew that it was no longer a matter of blows on his part. It was like the David of old facing Goliath with his bare hands. Curiously, the thought of Goliath came to him in these flashing moments. Here, too, there must be trickery something unexpected a deadly stratagem and his brain must work out his salvation quickly another two or three minutes and it would be over one way or the other he made his decision the tricks of his own art were inadequate but there was still one hope one last chance it was the so-called knee break of the bush country a horrible thing he had thought when father roland had taught it to him break your opponent's knees the missioner had said and you've got him he had never practiced it but he knew the method and he remembered the little missioner's words when he's straight facing you with all your weight like a cannonball and suddenly he shot himself out like that as brokaw was about to rush upon him a hundred and sixty pounds of solid flesh and bone against the joints of brokaw's knees the shock dazed him there was a sharp pain in his left shoulder, and with that shock and pain he was conscious of a terrible cry as Brokaw crashed over him. He was on his feet when Brokaw was on his knees. Whether or not they were really broken he could not tell. With all the strength in his body he sent his right again and again to the bleeding jaw of his enemy. Brokaw reached up and caught him in his huge arms, but that jaw was there unprotected, and David battered it as he might have battered a rock with a hammer. A gasping cry rose out of the giant's throat. His head sank backward, and through a red fury, through blood that splattered up into his face, David continued to strike and strike until the arms relaxed about him, and with a choking gurgle of blood in his throat, Brokaw dropped back limply, as if dead. And then David looked again beyond the bars. The staring faces had drawn nearer to the cage, bewildered, stupefied, disbelieving, like the faces of stone images. For a space it was so quiet that it seemed to him that they must hear his panting breath and the choking gurgle that was still in Brokaw's throat. The victor! He flung back his shoulders and held up his head, though he had great desire to stagger against one of the bars and rest. He could see the girl and Hawk, and now the girl was standing alone, looking at him. She had seen him. She had seen him beat that giant beast, and the great pride rose in his breast and spread in a joyous light over his bloody face. Suddenly he lifted his hand and waved it at her. In a flash she was coming to him. She would have broken her way through the cordon of men, but Hawk stopped her. He had seen Hawk talking swiftly to two of the white men, and now Hawk caught the girl and held her back. David knew that he was dripping red, and he was glad that she came no nearer. Hawk was telling her to go to the house, and David nodded, and with a movement of his hand made her understand that she must obey. Not until he saw her going did he pick up his shirt and step out among the men. Three or four of the whites went to Brokaw. The rest stared at him still in that amazed silence as he passed among them. He nodded and smiled at them as though beating Brokaw had not been such a terrible task after all. He noticed there was scarcely an expression in the faces of the Indians, and then he found himself face to face with Hawk, and a step or two behind Hawk were the two white men he had talked to so hurriedly. One of them was the man David had brushed against in passing through the big room. There was a grin in his face now. There was a grin in Hawk's face, and a grin in the face of the third man, and to David's astonishment Hawk thrust out his hand. Shake, Rain, I'd have bet a thousand to fifty you were a loser, 
but there wasn't a dollar going your way a great fight he turned to the other two take rain to his room boys help him wash up i've got to see to brokaw and this crowd david protested he was all right he needed only water and soap both of which were in his room but hawk insisted that it wasn't square and wouldn't look right if he didn't have friends as well as brokaw brokaw had forced the affair so suddenly that none of them had had time or thought to speak an encouraging or friendly word before the fight langdon and henry would go with him now he walked between the two to the nest and entered his room with them langdon the tall man who had looked hatred at him last night poured water into a tin basin while henry the smaller man closed his door they appeared quite companionable especially langdon didn't like you last night he confessed frankly thought you was one of them damn police running your nose into our business maybe he stood beside david with a pail of water in his hand and as david bent over the basin henry was behind him he had drawn something from his pocket and was edging up close as david dipped his hands into the water he looked up into langdon's face and he saw there a strange and unexpected change that deadly malignity of last night in that moment the object in henry's hand fell with terrific force on his head and he crumpled down over the basin he was conscious of a single agonizing pain like a hot iron thrust suddenly through him and then a great and engulfing pit of darkness closed about him end of chapter twenty four Chapter Twenty Five of the Courage of Marjo Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Courage of Marjo Doone by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty Five. In that chaotic night in which he was drifting, David experienced neither pain nor very much of the sense of life. And yet, without seeing or feeling, he seemed to be living. All was dead within him, but that last consciousness, which is almost the spirit, he might have been dreaming, and minutes, hours, or even years might have passed in that dream. For a long time he seemed to be sinking through the blackness, and then something stopped him without jar or shock and he was rising he could hear nothing at first there was a vast silence about him a silence as deep and unbroken as the abysmal pit in which he seemed to be floating after that he felt himself swaying and rocking as though tossed gently on the billows of a sea this was the first thought that took shape in his struggling brain that he was at sea he was on a ship in the heart of a black night and he was alone he tried to call out but his tongue seemed gone it seemed a long time before day broke and then it was a strange day little needles of light pricked his eyes silver strings shot like flashes of wave light lightning through the darkness and he began to feel and to hear a dozen hands seemed holding him down until he could move neither arms nor feet he heard voices there appeared to be many of them at first an unintelligible rumble of voices and then very swiftly they became two he opened his eyes the first thing that he observed was a bar of sunlight against the eastern wall of his room that bit of sunlight was like a magnet thrown there to reassemble the faculties that had drifted away from him in the dark night of his unconsciousness it tried to tell him first of all that it was afternoon quite late in the afternoon he would have sensed that fact in another moment or two but something came between him and the radiance flung by the westward slant of the sun it was a face two faces first hawks and then brokaw's yes brokaw was there staring down at him a fiend still and almost unrecognizable he was no longer stripped and he was no longer bloody his countenance was swollen his lips were raw one eye was closed but the other gleamed like a devil's david tried to sit up he managed with an effort and balanced himself on the edge of his cot his head was dizzy and he felt clumsy and helpless as a stuffed bag 
His hands were tied behind him, and his feet were bound. He thought Hawk looked like an exultant gargoyle as he stood there with a horrible grin on his face. And Brokaw, it was Brokaw who bent over him, his thick fingers knotting, his open eyes fairly livid. I'm glad you ain't dead, Rain. His voice was husky, muffled by the swollen thickness of his battered lips. Thanks, said David. The dizziness was leaving him, but there was a steady pain in his head. He tried to smile. Thanks. It was rather idiotic of him to say that. Brokaw's hands were moving slowly toward his throat when Hawk drew him back. I won't touch him, not now, he growled. But tonight, oh God, his knuckles snapped. You liar, you spy, you sneak, he cursed through his broken teeth. David saw where they had been, a cavity in that cruel, battered mouth. And you think after that? Again Hawk tried to draw him away. Brokaw flung off his hands angrily. I won't touch him, but I'll tell him, Hawk. The devil take me body and soul if I don't. I want him to know. You're a fool, cried Hawk. Stop, or by heaven. Brokaw opened his mouth and laughed, and David saw the havoc of his blows. You'll do what, Hawk? Nothing. That's what you'll do. Ain't I told him you killed that Napo from McPherson? Ain't I told him enough to set us both swinging? He bent over David until his breath struck his face. I'm glad you didn't die, Rain, he repeated. Because I want to see you when you shuffle off. We're only waiting for the Indians to go. Old Wappy starts with his tribe at sunset. I'm sorry, but we can't get the heathen away any earlier, because he says it's good luck to start a journey at sunset in the molting moon. You'll start yours a little later, as soon as they are out of the sound of a rifle shot. You can't trust Indians, eh? You made a hit with old Wappy, and it wouldn't do to let him know we're going to send you where you sent my bear. Eh, would it? You mean you're going to murder me, said David. If standing you up against a tree and putting a bullet through your heart is murder, yes, gloated Brokaw. Murder, repeated David. He seemed powerless to say more than that. An overwhelming dizziness was creeping over him. The pain was splitting his head, and he swayed backward. He fought to recover himself, to hold himself up, but that returning sickness reached from his brain to the pit of his stomach, and with a groan he sank face downward on the cot. Brokaw was still talking, but he could no longer understand his words. He heard Hawk's sharp voice, their retreating footsteps, the opening and closing of the door, fighting all the time to keep himself from falling off into that black and bottomless pit again. It was many minutes before he drew himself to a sitting posture on the edge of his cot, this time slowly and guardedly, so that he would not rouse the pain in his head. It was there. He could feel it burning steadily and deeply, like one of his old-time headaches. The bar of sunlight was gone from the wall, and through the one small window in the west end of his room he saw the fading light of the day outside. It was morning when he had fought Brokaw. It was now almost night. The washbasin was where it had fallen when Henry struck him. He saw a red stain on the floor where he must have dropped, and then again he looked at the window. It was rather oddly out of place, so high up that one could not look in from the outside, a rectangular slit to let in light, and so narrow that a man could not have wormed his way through it. He had seen nothing particularly significant in its location, last night or this morning, but now its meaning struck him as forcibly as that of the pieces of babiche thong that bound his wrists and ankles. A guest might be housed in this room without suspicion, and at the turn of a key be made a prisoner. There was no way of escape unless one broke down the heavy door or cut through the log walls. Gradually he was overcoming his sensation of sickness. His head was clearing, and he began to breathe more deeply. He tried to move his cramped arms. They were without feeling. Lifeless weights hung to his shoulders. With an effort he thrust out his feet, and then through the window there came to him a low, thrilling sound. It was the muffled boom-boom-boom of a tom-tom. Wapi and his Indians were going, 
and he heard now a weird and growing chant a savage paean to the wild gods of the molting moon a gasp rose in his throat it was almost a cry his last hope was going with wapi and his tribe would they help him if they knew if he shouted if he shrieked for them through that open window it was a mad thought an impossible thought but it set his heart throbbing for a moment and then suddenly it seemed to stand still a key rattled turned the door opened and marjo doone stood before him she was panting sobbing as if she had been running a long distance she made no effort to speak but dropped at his feet and began sawing at the caribou babiche with a knife she had come prepared with that knife he felt the bond snap and before either had spoken she was at his back and his hands were free they were like lead she dropped the knife then and her hands were at his face dark with dry stain of blood and over and over again she was calling him by the name she had given him Sekwawin. And then the tribal chant of Wapi and his people grew nearer and louder as they passed into the forest and with a choking cry the girl drew back from David and stood facing him I Must hurry she said swiftly listen they are going Hawk or Brokaw will go as far as the lake with the Wapi and the one who does not go will return here See Sequewin, I have brought you a knife when he comes you must kill him the chanting voices had passed the pian was dying away in the direction of the forest he did not interrupt her with hand clutched at her breast she went on i waited until all were out there they kept me in my room and left marcy the old indian woman to watch me when they were all out to see wapi off i struck her over the head with the end of nisikku's rifle maybe she is dead tara is out there i know where to find him when it is dark I will make up a pack and within an hour we must go if hawk comes to your room before then or brokaw Kill him with the knife sake if you don't they will kill you Her voice broke in a gasp that was like a sob he struggled to rise stood swaying before her his legs unsteady as stilts under him My gun Marge my pistol he demanded trying to reach out his arms if I had them now they must have taken them she interrupted, but I have Nisikoo's rifle sake Oh, I must hurry they won't come to my room and Marcy is perhaps dead as soon as it is dark I will unlock your door and if one of them comes before then you must kill him you must you must She backed to the door and now she opened it and was gone a key clicked in the lock again he heard her swift footsteps in the hall and the second door opened and closed for a few minutes he stood without moving a little dazed by the suddenness with which she had left him she had not been in his room more than a minute or two she had been terribly frightened terribly afraid of discovery before her work was done on the floor at his feet lay the knife that was why she had come that was what she had brought him his blood began to tingle he could feel it resuming its course through his numbed legs and arms and he leaned over slowly half afraid that he would lose his balance and picked up the weapon the chanting of wapi and his people was only a distant murmur through the high window came the sound of returning voices voices of white men there swept through him the wild thrill of the thought that once more the fight was up to him marjo doone had done her part she had struck down the Indian woman Hawk had placed over her as a guard had escaped from her room Unbound him and put a knife into his hands the rest was his fight How long before Brokaw or Hawk would come would they give him time to get the blood running through his body again? Time to gain strength to use his freedom and the knife He began walking slowly across the room pumping his arms up and down his strength returned quickly he went to the pail of water and drank deeply with a consuming thirst the water refreshed him and he paced back and forth more and more swiftly until he was breathing steadily and he could harden his muscles and not his fists he looked at the knife it was a horrible necessity the burying of that steel in a man's back or in his heart 
Was there no other way? He wondered. He began searching the room. Why hadn't Marge brought him a club instead of a knife, or at least a club along with a knife? To club a man down, even when he was intent on murder, wasn't like letting out his life in a gush of blood. His eyes rested on the table, and in a moment he had turned it over and was wrenching at one of the wooden legs. It broke off with a sharp snap, and he held it in his hands, a weapon possessing many advantages over the knife. The latter he thrust into his belt with the handle just back of his hip, and then he waited. It was not for long. The western mountains had shut out the last reflections of the sun. Gloom was beginning to fill his room, and he numbered the minutes as he stood with his ear close to the door, listening for a step, hopeful that it would be the girls and not Hawks or Brokaws. At last the step came, advancing from the end of the hall. It was a heavy step, and he drew in a deep breath and gripped the club. His heart gave a sudden mighty throb as the step stopped at his door. It was not pleasant to think of what he was about to do, and yet he realized as he heard the key in the lock that it was a grim and terrible necessity. He was thankful there was only one. He would not strike too hard, not in this cowardly way, from ambush, just enough to do the business sufficiently well. It would be easy, quite. He raised his club in the thickening dusk and held his breath. The door opened and Hawk entered and stood with his back to David. Horrible, strike a man like that, and with a club. If he could use his hands, choke him, give him at least a quarter chance. But it had to be done. It was a sickening thing. Hawk went down without a groan, so silently, so lifelessly, that David thought he had killed him. He knelt beside him for a few seconds and made sure that his heart was beating before he rose to his feet. He looked out into the hall. The lamps had not been lighted. Probably that was one of the old Indian woman's duties. From the big room came a sound of voices, and then close to him from the door across the way there came a small trembling voice. Hurry, Sikwawin, lock the door and come. For another instant he dropped on his knees at Hawk's side. Yes, it was there, in his pocket, a revolver. He possessed himself of the weapon with an exclamation of joy, locked the door, and ran across the hall. The girl opened her door for him, and closed it behind him as he sprang into her room. The first object he noticed was the Indian woman. She was lying on a cot, and her black eyes were leveled at them like the eyes of a snake. She was trussed up so securely, and was gagged so thoroughly, that he could not restrain a laugh as he bent over her. Splendid, he cried softly. You're a little brick, Marge. You surely are. And now what? With his revolver in his hand, and the girl trembling under his arm, he felt a ridiculous desire to shout out at the top of his voice to his enemies, letting them know that he was again ready to fight. In the gloom the girl's eyes shone like stars. Who was it? she whispered. Hawk. Then it was Brokaw who went with Wapi. Langdon and Henry went with him. It's less than two miles to the lake, and they'll be returning soon. We must hurry. Look, it is growing dark. She ran from his arms to the window, and he followed her. In fifteen minutes we will go, Sigwawin. Tara is out there in the edge of the spruce. Her hand pinched his arm. Did you kill him? she breathed. No, I broke off a leg from the table and stunned him. I'm glad, she said, and snuggled close to him shiveringly. I'm glad, Sikwawin. In the darkness that was gathering about them, it was impossible for him not to take her in his arms. He held her close, bowing his head so that for an instant her warm face touched his own, and in those moments while they waited for the gloom to thicken, he told her in a low voice what he had learned from Brokaw. She grew tense against him as he continued, and when he assured her he no longer had a doubt her mother was alive and that she was the woman he had met on the coach, a cry rose out of her breast. She was about to speak when loud footsteps in the hall made her catch her breath, and her fingers clung more tightly at his shoulders. It is time, she whispered. We must go. She ran from him quickly, and from under the cot where the Indian lay, dragged forth a pack. He could not see plainly what she was doing now. In a moment she had put a rifle in his hands. 
It belonged to Nisikoos, she said. There are six shots in it, and here are all the cartridges I have. He took them in his hand and counted them as he dropped them into his pocket. There were eleven in all, including the six in the chamber. Thirty-twos, he thought, as he seized them up with his fingers. Good for partridges and short range at men. He said aloud, If we could get my rifle, Marge. They have taken it, she told him again. But we shall not need it, Sequawin, she added, as if his voice had revealed to her the thought in his mind. I know of a mountain that is all rock, not so far off as the one Tara and I climbed. And if we can reach that, they will not be able to trail us. If they should find us, she was opening the window. What then? he asked. The Sikhus once killed a bear with that gun, she replied. The window was open, and she was waiting. They thrust out their heads and listened, and when he had assured himself that all was clear, he dropped out the pack. He lifted Marge down then, and followed her. As his feet struck the ground, the slight shock sent a pain through his head that wrung a low cry from him, and for a moment he leaned with his back against the wall, almost overcome again by the sickening dizziness. It was not so dark that the girl did not see the sudden change in him. Her eyes filled with alarm. A little dizzy, he explained, trying to smile at her. They gave me a pretty hard crack on the head, Marge. This air will set me right, soon. He picked up the pack and followed her. In the edge of the spruce a hundred yards from the nest, Tara had been lying all that afternoon nursing his wounds. I could see him from my window, whispered Marge. She went straight to him and began talking to him in a low voice. Out of the darkness behind Tara came a growl. Bari, by thunder, muttered David in amazement. He's made up with the bear, Marge. What do you think of that? At the sound of his voice, Bari came to him and flattened himself at his feet. David laid a hand on his head. Boy, he whispered softly, and they said you were an outlaw and would join the wolves. He saw the dark bulk of Tara rising out of the gloom, and the girl was at his side. We are ready, Sequawin. He spoke to her the thought that had been shaping itself in his mind. Why wouldn't it be better to join Wapi and his Indians, he asked, remembering Brokaw's words. Because they are afraid of Hawk, she replied quickly. There is but one way, Sequawin, to follow a narrow trail Tara and I have made close to the foot of the range until we come to the rock mountain. Shall we risk the bundle on Tara's back? It is light. I'll carry it. Then give me your hand, Sequawin. There was again in her voice the joyous thrill of freedom and of confidence. He could hear for a moment the wild throb of her heart in its exultation at their escape. And with her warm little hand she gripped his fingers firmly and guided him into a sea of darkness. The forest shut them in. Not a ray fell upon them from out of the pale sky where the stars were beginning to glimmer faintly. Behind them he could hear the heavy padded footfall of the big grizzly, and he knew that Bari was very near. After a little the girl said, still in a whisper, Does your head hurt you now, Sequawin? A bit. The trail was widening. It was quite smooth for a space, but black. She pressed his fingers. I believe all you have told me, she said, as if making a confession. After you came to me in the cage and the fight, I believed. You must have loved me a great deal to risk all that for me. Yes, a great deal, my child, he answered. Why did that dizziness persist in his head, he wondered. For a moment he felt as if he were falling. A very great deal, he added, trying to walk steadily at her side, his own voice sounding unreal and at a great distance from him. You see, my child, I didn't have anything to love but your picture. What a fool he was to try and make himself heard above the roaring in his head. His words seemed to him whispers coming across a great space, and the bundle on his shoulders was like a crushing weight bearing him down. The voice at his side was growing fainter. It was saying things which afterward he could not remember, but he knew that it was talking about the woman he had said was her mother, and that he was answering it while weights of lead were dragging at his feet. And then suddenly 
He had stepped over the edge of the world and was floating in that vast black chaos again. The voice did not leave him. He could hear it sobbing, entreating him, urging him to do something which he could not understand, and when at last he did begin to comprehend it, he knew also that he was no longer walking with weights at his feet and a burden on his shoulders, but was on the ground. His head was on her breast, and she was no longer speaking to him, but was crying like a child with a heart utterly broken. The deathly sickness was gone as quickly as it had stricken him, and he struggled upward, with her arms helping him. "'You are hurt, hurt,' he heard her moaning. "'If I can only get you on Tara, Sekwawin, on Tara's back, there, a step!' and he knew that was what she had been saying over and over again, urging him to help himself if he could, so that she could get him to Tara. He reached out his hand and buried it in the thick hair of the grizzly, and he tried to speak laughingly so that she would not know his fears. "'One is often dizzy like that after a blow,' he said. "'I guess I can walk now.' No, no, you must ride Tara, she insisted. You are hurt, and you must ride Tara, Sekwawin, you must. She was lifting at his arms with all her strength, her breath hot and panting in his face, and Tara stood without moving a muscle of his giant body, as if he too were urging upon him in this dumb manner the necessity of obeying his mistress. Even then David would have remonstrated, but he felt once more that appalling sickness creeping over him, and he raised himself slowly astride the grizzly's broad back. The girl picked up the bundle and rifle, and Tara followed her through the darkness. To David the beast's great back seemed a wonderfully safe and comfortable place, and he leaned forward with his fingers, clutched deeply into the long hair of the ruff about the bear's bulking shoulders. The girl called back to him softly. "'You are all right, Sequawin? "'Yes.' It is so comfortable that I feel I may fall asleep, he replied. Out in the starlight she would have seen his drooping head, and his words would have had a different meaning for her. He was fighting with himself desperately, and in his heart was a great fear. He must be badly hurt, he thought. There came to him a distorted but vivid vision of an Indian, hurt in the head, whom he and Father Roland had tried to save. Without a surgeon it had been impossible. The Indian had died, and he had had those same spells of sickness, the sickness that was creeping over him again, in spite of his efforts to fight it off. He had no very clear notion of the movement of Tara's body under him, but he knew that he was holding on grimly, and that every little while the girl called back to him, and he replied. And then came the time when he failed to answer, and for a space the rocking motion under him ceased, and the girl's voice seemed very near to him. Afterward motion resumed. It seemed to him that he was traveling a great distance, altogether too far without a halt for sleep, or at least a rest. He was conscious of a desire to voice protest, and all the time his fingers were clasped in Tara's mane in a sort of death grip. In her breast Marge's heart was beating like a hunted thing, and over and over again she sobbed out a broken prayer as she guided Tara and his burden through the night. From the forest into the starlit open, from the open into a thick gloom of forest again, into and out of starlight and darkness, following that trail down the valley. She was no longer thinking of the rock mountain, for it would be impossible now to climb over the range into the other valley. She was heading for a cabin, an old and abandoned cabin where they could hide. She tried to tell David about it, many days after they had begun that journey it seemed to him. Only a little longer, Sequawin, she cried, with her arm about him and her lips close to his bent head. Only a little longer. They will not think to search for us there, and you can sleep, sleep. Her voice drifted away from him like a low murmur in the treetops and his fingers still clung in that death grip in the mane at Tara's neck. And still many other days later they came to the cabin. It was amazing to him that the girl should say, We are now only five miles from the nest, Sequawin, but they will not hunt for us here. They will think we have gone farther or over the mountains. She was putting cold water to his face, 
and now that there was no longer the rolling motion under him he was not quite so dizzy she had unrolled the bundle and had spread out a blanket and when he stretched himself out on this a sense of vast relief came over him in his confused consciousness two or three things stood out with rather odd clearness before he closed his eyes and the last was a vision of the girl's face bending over him and of her starry eyes looking down at him and of her voice urging him gently try to sleep Sekwawin. try to sleep it was many hours later when he awoke hands seemed to be dragging him forcibly out of a place in which he was very comfortable and which he did not want to leave and the voice was accompanying the hands with an annoying insistency a voice which was growing more and more familiar to him as his sleeping senses were roused he opened his eyes it was day and marge was on her knees at his side tugging at his breast with her hands and staring wildly into his face wake sakewawin wake wake he heard her crying oh my god you must wake sakewawin sakewawin they have found our trail and i can see them coming up the valley end of chapter 25Chapter Twenty Six of the Courage of Marge O'Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Courage of Marge O'Doone by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty Six. Scarcely had David sensed the girl's words of warning than he was on his feet. And now when he saw her he thanked God that his head was clear and that he could fight Even yesterday when she had stood before the fighting bears and he had fought Brokaw She had not been whiter than she was now Her face told him of their danger before he had seen it with his own eyes It told him that their peril was appallingly near and there was no chance of escaping it he saw for the first time that his bed on the ground had been close to the wall of an old cabin Which was in a little dip in the sloping face of the mountain Before he could take in more or discover a visible sign of their enemies Marge had caught his hand and was drawing him to the end of the shack She did not speak as she pointed downward in the edge of the valley just beginning the ascent were eight or ten men he could not determine their exact number for as he looked they were already disappearing under the face of the lower dip in the mountain They were not more than four or five hundred yards away It would take them a matter of twenty minutes to make the ascent to the cabin. He looked at Marge Despairingly she pointed to the mountain behind them for a quarter of a mile It was a sheer wall of red sandstone their one way of flight lay downward practically into the faces of their enemies I Was going to rouse you before it was light Sake she explained in a voice that was dead with hopelessness I kept awake for hours and then I fell asleep Bari awakened me and now it is too late Yes too late to run said David a flash of fire leaped into her eyes You mean we can fight he cried Good God, Marge, if only I had my own rifle now. He thrust a hand into his pocket and drew forth the cartridges she had given him. Thirty twos, and only eleven of them. It's got to be a short range for us. We can't put up a running fight, for they'd keep us out of range of this little pea shooter and fill me as full of holes as a sieve. She was tugging at his arm. The cabin, Sequawin, she exclaimed with sudden inspiration. It has a strong bar at the door and the clay has fallen in places from between the logs leaving openings through which you can shoot He was examining the rifle at a hundred and fifty yards. It should be good for a man. He said You get Tara and the pack inside Marge I'm going to try to get two or three of our friends as they come up over the knoll down there They won't be looking for bullets this early in the game, and I'll have them at a disadvantage if I'm lucky enough to get Hawk and Brokaw his eyes had selected a big rock 20 yards from the cabin from which he could overlook the slope to the first dip below them and as Marge darted from him to get Tara into the cabin he crouched behind a boulder and waited 
he figured that it was not more than a hundred and fifty yards to the point where their pursuers would first appear and he made up his mind that he would wait until they were nearer than that before he opened fire not one of those eleven precious cartridges must be wasted for he could count on hawk's revolver only at close quarters it was no longer a time for doubt or indecision brokaw and hawk were deliberately pushing the fight to a finish and not to beat them meant death for himself and a fate for the girl which made him grip his rifle more tightly as he waited he looked behind him and saw marge leading tara into the cabin Varee had crept up beside him and lay flat on the ground close to the rock a moment or two later the girl reappeared and ran across the narrow open space to david and crouched down close to him you must go into the cabin marge he remonstrated they'll probably begin shooting i'm going to stay with you saquawin her face was no longer white a flush had risen into her cheeks her eyes shone as she looked at him and she smiled a child his heart rose chokingly in his throat her face was close to his and she whispered last night i kissed you sakwawan i thought you were dying before you i have kissed nisikus never anyone else why did she say that with that wonderful glow in her eyes couldn't be that she saw death climbing up the mountain was it because she wanted him to know before that a child she whispered again and you have never kissed me sakwawin why slowly he drew her to him until her head lay against his breast her shining eyes her parted lips turned up to him and he kissed her on the mouth a wild flood of color rushed into her face and her arms crept up about his shoulders the glory of her radiant hair covered his breast he buried his face in it and for a moment crushed her so close that she did not breathe and then again he kissed her mouth not once but a dozen times and then held her back from him and looked into her face that was no longer the face of a child but of a woman because he began and stopped Bari was growling david peered down the slope they are coming he said marge you must creep back to the cabin i am going to stay with you sakwawin see I will flatten myself out like this with Bari. She snuggled herself down against the rock, and again David peered from his ambush. Their pursuers were well over the crest of the dip, and he counted nine. They were advancing in a group, as he saw that both Hawk and Brokaw were in the rear, and that they were using staffs in their toil upward, and did not carry rifles. The remaining seven were armed and were headed by Langdon who was fifteen or twenty yards in advance of his companions David made up his mind quickly to take Langdon first and to follow up with others who carried rifles Hawk and Brokaw unarmed with guns were least dangerous just at present He would get Brokaw with his fifth shot the sixth if he made a miss with the fifth a thin strip of shale marked his one hundred yard deadline and the instant langdon set his foot on this david fired he was scarcely conscious of the yell of defiance that rang from his lips as langdon whirled in his tracks and pitched down among the men behind him he rose up boldly from behind the rock and fired again in that huddled and astonished mass he could not miss a shriek came up to him he fired a third time and he heard a joyous cry of triumph beside him as their enemies rushed for safety toward the dip from which they had just climbed a fourth shot and he picked out brokaw twice he missed his gun was empty when brokaw lunged out of view langdon remained an inanimate blotch on the strip of shale a few steps below him was a second body a third man was dragging himself on hands and knees over the crest of the coulee three with six shots and he had missed brokaw inwardly david groaned as he caught the girl by the arm and hurried with her into the cabin followed by bari and they were not a moment too soon from over the edge of the coulee came a fusillade of shots from the heavy caliber weapons of the mountain men that sent out sparks of fire from the rock as he thrust the remaining five cartridges into the chamber of nisiku's rifle david looked about the cabin in one of the farther corners the huge grizzly sat on his quarters as motionless as if stuffed 
In the center of the single room was an old box stove partly fallen to pieces, and that was all. Marge had dropped the sapling bar across the door and stood with her back against it. There was no window, and the closing of the door had shut out most of the light. He could see that she was breathing quickly, and the wonderful light that had come into her eyes behind the rock was still glowing at him in the half-gloom. It gave him fresh confidence to see her standing like that, looking at him in that way, telling him without words that a thing had come into her life which had lifted her above fear. He went to her and took her in his arms again, and again he kissed her sweet mouth and felt her heart beating against him, and the warm thrill of her arms clinging to him. A splintering crash sent him reeling back into the center of the cabin with Marge in his arms. The crash had come simultaneously with the report of a rifle, and both saw where the bullet had passed through the door, six inches above David's head, carrying a splinter as large as his arm with it. He had not thought of the door. It was the cabin's vulnerable point, and he sprang out of line with it as a second bullet crashed through and buried itself in the log wall at their backs. Barry growled. A low rumble rose in Tara's throat, but he did not move. In each of the four log walls were the open chinks which Marge had told him about, and he sprang to one of these apertures that was wide enough to let the barrel of his rifle through and looked in the direction from which the two shots had come. He was in time to catch a movement among the rocks on the side of the mountain, about two hundred yards away, and a third shot tore its way through the door, glanced from the steel top of the stove, and struck like a club two feet over Tara's back. There were two men up there among the rocks, and their first shots were followed by a steady bombardment that fairly riddled the door. David could see their heads and shoulders, and the gleam and faint puffs of their rifles, but he held his fire. Where were the other four, he wondered? Without doubt, Hawk and Brokaw were now armed with the rifles of the men who had fallen, so he had six to deal with. Cautiously he thrust the muzzle of his rifle through the crack and watched his chance, aiming a foot and a half above the spot where a pair of shoulders and a head would appear in a moment. His chance came and he fired. The head and shoulders disappeared, and exultantly he swung his rifle a little to the right, and then sent another shot as the second man exposed himself. He too disappeared, and David's heart was thumping wildly in the thought that his bullets had reached their marks when both heads appeared again, and a hail of lead splattered against the cabin. The men among the rocks were no longer aiming at the door, but at the spot from which he had fired and a bullet ripped through so close that a splinter stung his face, and he felt the quick warm flow of blood down his cheek. When the girl saw it, her face went as white as death. "'I can't get them with this rifle, Marge,' he groaned. "'It's wild, wild as a hawk. Good God!' A crash of fire had come from behind the cabin, and another bullet, finding one of the gaping cracks, passed between them with a sound like the buzz of a monster bee. With a sudden cry, he caught her in his arms and held her tight, as if in his embrace he would shield her. Is it possible they would kill you to get me? He loosed his hold of her, sprang to the broken stove, and began dragging it out of the line of fire that came through the door. The girl saw his peril and sprang to help him. He had no time to urge her back. In ten seconds he had the stove close to the wall, and almost forcibly he made her crouch down behind it. If you expose yourself for one second, I swear to heaven I'll stand up there against the door until I'm shot, he threatened. I will, so help me God. His brain was afire. He was no longer cool or self-possessed. He was blind with a wild rage, with a mad desire to reach in some way, with his vengeance, the human beasts who were bent on his death, even if it was to be gained at the sacrifice of the girl. He rushed to the side of the cabin from which fresh attack had come, and glared through one of the embrasures between the logs. He was close to Tara, and he heard the low, steady thunder that came out of the grizzly's chest. His enemies were near on this side. Their fire came from the rocks, not more than a hundred yards away. And all at once, in the heat of the great passion that possessed him now, he became suddenly aware that they knew the only weapon he possessed was Nisiku's little rifle and Hawk's revolver. 
Probably they knew also how limited his ammunition was, and they were exposing themselves. Why should he save his last three shots? When they were gone and he no longer answered their fire, they would rush the cabin, beat in the door, and then the revolver. With that he would tear out their hearts as they entered. He saw Hawk, fired, and missed. A man stood up within seventy yards of the cabin a moment later, firing as fast as he could pump the lever of his gun, and David drove one of Nisiku's partridge killers straight into his chest. He fired a second time at Hawk, another miss, and then he flung the useless rifle to the floor as he sprang back to Marge. Got one, five left. Now, damn em, let em come. He drew Hawk's revolver. A bullet flew through one of the cracks and they heard the soft thud of it as it struck Tara. The growl in the grizzly's throat burst forth in a roar of thunder. The terrible sound shook the cabin, but Tara still made no movement, except now to swing his head with open, drooling jaws. In response to that cry of animal rage and pain, a snarl had come from Barry. He had slung close to Tara. Didn't hurt him much, said David, with the fingers of his free hand crumpling the girl's hair. They'll stop shooting in a minute or two, and then, straight into his eyes from that farther wall, a splinter hurled itself at him with a hissing sound like the plunge of a hot iron into water. He had a lightning impression of seeing that bullet as it tore through the clay between two of the logs. He knew that he was struck, and yet he felt no pain. His mind was acutely alive, yet he could not speak. His words had been cut off. His tongue was powerless. It was like a shock that had paralyzed him. Even the girl did not know for a moment or two that he was hit. The thud of his revolver on the floor filled her eyes with the first horror of understanding, and she sprang to his side as he swayed like a drunken man toward Tara. He sank down on the floor a few feet from the grizzly, and he heard the girl moaning over him and calling him by name. The numbness left him. Slowly, he raised a hand to his chin, filled with a terrible fear. It was there, his jaw hard, unsmashed, but wet with blood. He thought the bullet had struck him there. A knockout were the first words, spoken slowly and thickly, but with a great gasp of relief. A splinter hit me on the jaw. I'm all right. He sat up dizzily with the girl's arm about him. In the three or four minutes of forgetfulness, neither had noticed that the firing had ceased. Now there came a tremendous blow at the door. It shook the cabin. A second blow, a third, and the decaying saplings were crashing inward. David struggled to rise, fell back, and pointed to the revolver. Quick, the revolver! Marge sprang to it. The door crashed inward as she picked it up, and scarcely had she faced about when their enemies were rushing in, with Henry and Hawk in their lead, and Brokaw just behind them. With a last effort David fought to gain his feet. He heard a single shot from the revolver, and then as he rose staggeringly, he saw Marge fighting in Brokaw's arms. Hawk came for him, the demon of murder in his face, and as they went down, he heard scream after scream come from the girl's lips and in that scream, the agonizing call of, Tara, Tara, Tara. Over him, he heard a sudden roar, the rush of a great body, and with that thunder of Tara's rage and vengeance, there mingled a hideous wolfish snarl from Barry. He could see nothing. Hawk's hands were at his throat. But the screams continued, and above them came now the cries of men, cries of horror, of agony, of death. And as Hawk's fingers loosened at his neck, he heard with a snarling and roaring and tumult the crushing of great jaws and the thud of bodies. Hawk was rising, his face blanched with a strange terror. He was half up when a gaunt, lithe body shot at him like a stone flung from a catapult, and Bari's inch-long fangs sank into his thick throat and tore his head half from his body in one savage, snarling snap of the jaws. David raised himself, and through the horror of what he saw, the girl ran to him, unharmed, and clasped her arms about him, her lips sobbing all the time, Tara, Tara, Tara. He turned her face to his breast and held it. There, it was ghastly. Henry was dead, Hawk was dead, and Brokaw was dead, a thousand times dead, with the grizzly tearing his huge body into pieces. Through that pit of death, 
David stumbled with the girl. The fresh air struck their faces. The sun of day fell upon them. The green grass and the flowers of the mountain were under their feet. They looked down the slope and saw, disappearing over the crest of the coulee, two men who were running for their lives. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of the Courage of Marge O'Doon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Courage of Marge O'Doon by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Twenty Seven. It may have been five minutes that David held the girl in his arms staring down into the sunlit valley into which the last two of hawk's men had fled and during that time he did not speak and he heard only her steady sobbing he drew into his lungs deep breaths of the invigorating air and he felt himself growing stronger as the girl's body became heavier in his embrace and her arms relaxed and slipped down from his shoulders he raised her face there were no tears in her eyes but she was still moaning a little, and her lips were quivering like a crying child's. He bent his head and kissed them, and she caught her breath pantingly as she looked at him with eyes which were limpid pools of blue, out of which her terror was slowly dying away. She whispered his name. In her look and in that whisper there was unutterable adoration. It was for him she had been afraid. She was looking at him now as one saved to her from the dead, and for a moment he strained her still closer. And as he crushed his face to hers, he felt the warm, sweet caress of her lips, and the thrilling pressure of her hands at his blood-stained cheeks. A sound from behind made him turn his head, and fifty feet away he saw the big grizzly ambling cumbrously from the cabin. They could hear him growling as he stood in the sunshine his head swinging slowly from side to side like a huge pendulum. In his throat, the last echoing of that ferocious rage and hate that had destroyed their enemies. And in the same moment, Barry stood in the doorway, his lips drawn back and his fangs gleaming as if he expected other enemies to face him. Quickly David led Marge beyond the boulder from behind which he had opened the fight and drew her down with him into a soft carpet of grass, thick with the blue of wild violets, with a big rock shutting out the cabin from their vision. "'Rest here, little comrade,' he said, his voice low and trembling with his worship of her, his hands stroking back her wonderful hair. "'I must return to the cabin. Then we will go.' "'Go!' She repeated the word in the strangest, softest whisper he had ever heard, as if in it all at once she saw the sun and stars, the day and night of her whole life. She looked from his face down into the valley and into his face again. We will go, she repeated as he rose to his feet. She shivered when he left her shuddered with a terrible little cry which she tried to choke back even as she visioned the first glow of that wonderful new life that was dawning for her david knew why he left her without looking down into her eyes again anxious to have those last terrible minutes over at the open door of the cabin he hesitated a little sick at what he knew he would see and yet after all it was no worse than it should be it was justice, he told himself this as he stepped inside. He tried not to look too closely, but the sight after a moment fascinated him. If it had not been for the difference in their size, he could not have told which was Hawk and which was Brokaw. For even on Hawk, Tara had vented his rage after Bari had killed him. Neither bore very much the semblance of a man just now. It seemed incredible that claw and fang could have worked such destruction. And he went suddenly back to the door to see that the girl was not following him. And then he looked again. Henry lay at his feet across the fallen saplings of the battered door, his head twisted completely under him or gone. It was Henry's rifle he picked up. 
He searched for cartridges then. It was a sickening task. He found nearly fifty of them on the three, and went out with the pack and the rifle. He put the pack over his shoulders before he returned to the rock, and paused only for a moment when he rejoined the girl. With her hand in his, he struck down into the valley. A great justice has overtaken them, he said, and that was all he told her about the cabin, and she asked him no questions. At the edge of the green meadows they stopped where a trickle of water from the mountain tops had formed a deep pool. David followed this trickle a little up the coulee it had worn in the course of ages, found a sheltered spot, and stripped himself. To the waist he was covered with a stain and grime of battle. In the open pool Marge bathed her face and arms, and then sat down to finish her toilet with David's comb and brush. When he returned to her, she was a radiant glory, hidden to her waist in the gold and brown fires of her disentangled hair. It was wonderful. He stood a step off and looked at her, his heart filled with a wonderful joy, his lips silent. The thought surged upon him now in an overmastering moment of exultation that she belonged to him, not for today or tomorrow, but for all time that the mountains had given her to him, that among the flowers and the wild things that great good God, of whom Father Roland had spoken so often, had created her for him, and that she had been waiting for him here, pure as the wild violets under his feet. She did not see him for a space, and he watched her as she ran out her glowing tresses under the strokes of his brush. And once, ages ago it seemed to him now, he had thought that another woman was beautiful, and that another woman's glory was her hair. He felt his heart singing. She had not been like this. No, worlds separated those two, that woman and this God-crowned little mountain flower, who had come into his heart like the breath of a new life, opening for him new visions that reached even beyond the blue skies. And he wondered that she should love him. She looked up suddenly and saw him standing there. Love? Had he in all his life dreamed of the look that was in her face now? It made his heart choke him. He held open his arms, silently as she rose to her feet, and she came to him in all that burnished glory of her unbound hair, and he held her close in his arms, kissing her soft lips, her flushed cheeks, her blue eyes, the warm sweetness of her hair, and her lips kissed him. He looked out over the valley. His eyes were open to its beauty, but he did not see. A vision was rising before him, and his soul was breathing a prayer of gratitude to the missioner's God, to the God of the totem worshippers over the ranges, to the God of all things. It may be that the girl sensed his voiceless exaltation, for up through the soft billows of her hair, that lay crumpled on his breast, she whispered, You love me a great deal, my Sekwawin? More than life, he replied. Her voice roused him. For a few moments he had forgotten the cabin, had forgotten that Brokaw and Hawk had existed, and that they were now dead. He held her back from him, looking into her face, out of which all fear and horror had gone in its great happiness a face filled with a joyous color, sent surging there by the wild beating of her heart, eyes confessing their adoration without shame, without concealment, without a droop of the long lashes behind which they might have hidden. It was wonderful, that love, shining straight out of their blue, marvelous depths. We must go now, he said, forcing himself to break the spell. Two have escaped, Marge, it is possible if there are others at the nest. His words brought her back to the thing they had passed through. She glanced in a startled way over the valley, and then shook her head. There are two others, she said, but they will not follow us, Sequawin. If they should, we shall be over the mountain. She braided her hair as he adjusted his pack. His heart was like a boy's. He laughed at her in joyous disapproval. I like to see it unbound, he said. It is beautiful, glorious. 
It seemed to him that all the blood in her body leaped into her face at his words. Then I will leave it that way, she cried softly, her words trembling with happiness and her fingers working swiftly in the silken plates of her braid. Unconfined, her hair shimmered about her again, and then as they were about to set off, she ran up to him with a little cry, and without touching him with her hands, raised her face to his. Kiss me, she said. Kiss me, my Sequawin. It was noon when they stood under the topmost crags of the southward range, and under them they saw once more the green valley with its silvery stream in which they had met that first day beside the great rock. It seemed to them both a long time ago, and the valley was like a friend, smiling up at them its welcome and its gladness that they had at last returned. Its drone of running waters, the whispering music of the air, and the piping cries of the marmots, sunning themselves far below, came up to them faintly as they rested. And as the girl sat in the circle of David's arm, with her head against his breast, she pointed off through the blue haze, miles to the eastward. Are we going that way? she asked. He had been thinking as they had climbed up the mountain. Off there where she was pointing were his friends and hers. Between them and that wandering tribe of the totem people on the Quadoka, there were no human beings, nothing but the unbroken peace of the mountains in which they were safe. He had ceased to fear their immensity, was no longer disturbed by the thought that in their vast and trackless solitude he might lose himself forever. After what had passed, their gleaming peaks were beckoning to him, and he was confident that he could find his way back to the Finlay and down to Hudson's Hope. What a surprise it would be to Father Roland when they dropped in on him some day, he and Marge. His heart beat excitedly as he told her about it. Describe the great distance they must travel, and what a wonderful journey it would be, with that glorious country at the end of it. We'll find your mother then, he whispered. They talked a great deal about her mother, and Father Roland, as they made their way down into the valley, and whenever they stopped to rest, she had new questions to ask, and each time there was that trembling doubt in her voice. I wonder whether it's true, and each time he assured her that it was. I have been thinking that it was Nisikus who sent to her that picture you wanted to destroy, he said once. Nisikus must have known. Then why didn't she tell me, she flashed, because it may be that she didn't want to lose you, and that she didn't send the picture until she knew that she was not going to live very long. The girl's eyes darkened, and then slowly there came back the softer glow into them. I loved Nisikus, she said. It was sunset when they began making their first camp in a cedar thicket where David shot a porcupine for Tara and Bari. After their supper, they sat for a while in the glow of the stars, and after that Marge snuggled down in her cedar bed and went to sleep. But before she closed her eyes, she put her arms about his neck and kissed him good night. For a long time after that he sat awake, thinking of the wonderful dream he had dreamed all his life, and which at last had come true. Day after day they traveled steadily into the east and south. The mountains swallowed them, and their feet trod the grass of many strange valleys. Strange, and yet now and then David saw something he had seen once before, and he knew that he had not lost the trail. They traveled slowly, for there was no longer need of haste, and in that land of plenty there was more of pleasure than inconvenience in their foraging for what they ate. In her haste in making up the contents of the pack, Marge had seized what first came to her hands in the way of provisions, and fortunately the main part of their stock was a twenty-pound sack of oatmeal. Of this they made bannock and cakes. The country was full of game. In the valleys the black currants and wild raspberries were ripening lusciously, and now and then in the pools of the lower valleys David would shoot fish. Both Tara and Bari began to grow fat and with quiet joy David noticed that each day added to the wonderful beauty and happiness in the girl's face. And it seemed to him that her love was enveloping him more and more, and there never was a moment now that he could not see the glow of it in her eyes. It thrilled him that she did not want him out of her presence for more than a few minutes at a time. 
He loved to fondle her hair, and she had a sweet habit of running her fingers through his own, and telling him each time how she loved it because it was a little gray, and she had a still sweeter way of holding one of his hands in hers when she was sitting beside him, and pressing it now and then to her soft lips. They had been ten days in the mountains when one evening, sitting beside him in this way, she said with that adorable and almost childish ingenuousness which he loved in her, It will be nice to have Father Roland marry us, Sigwawin. And before he could answer, she added, I will keep house for you too at the chateau. He had been thinking a great deal about it. But if your mother should live down there among the cities, he asked. She shivered a little and nestled to him. I wouldn't like it, Sequawin, not for long. I love this, the forest, the mountains, the skies. And then suddenly she caught herself and added quickly, But anywhere, anywhere, if you are there, Sequawin. I too love the forests, the mountains, and the skies, he whispered. We will have them with us always, little comrade. It was the fourteenth day when they descended the eastern slopes of the Divide, and he knew that they were not far from the Quadoka and the Finlay. Their fifteenth night they camped where he and the butterfly's lover had built a noonday fire, and this night, though it was warm and glorious with a full moon, the girl was possessed of a desire to have a fire of their own, and she helped to add fuel to it until the flames leaped high up into the shadows of the spruce and drove them far back with its heat. David was content to sit and smoke his pipe, while he watched her flit here and there after still more fuel, and now a shadow in the darkness and then again in the full fire glow. After a time she grew tired and nestled down beside him, spreading her hair over his breast and about his face in the way she knew he loved, and for an hour after that they talked in whispering voices that trembled with their happiness. When at last she went to bed and fell asleep, he walked a little way out into the clear moonlight and sat down to smoke and listen to the murmur of the valley, his heart too full for sleep. Suddenly he was startled by a voice. David! He sprang up. From the shadow of a dwarf spruce half a dozen paces from him had stepped the figure of a man. He stood with bared head, the light of the moon streaming down upon him, and out of David's breast rose a strange cry, as if it were a spirit he saw, and not a man. David! My God! Father Roland! They sprang across the little space between them, and their hands clasped. David could not speak. Before he found his voice, the missioner was saying, I saw the fire, David, and I stole up quietly to see who it was. We are camped down there not more than a quarter of a mile. Come, I want you to see. He stopped. He was excited, and to David his face seemed many years younger there in the moonlight, and he walked with a spring of youth as he caught his arm and started down the valley. A strange force held David silent, an indefinable feeling that something tremendous and unexpected was impending. He heard the other's quick breath, caught the glow in his eyes, and his heart was thrilled. They walked so swiftly that it seemed to him only a few moments when they came to a little clump of low trees, and into these Father Roland led David by the hand, treading lightly now. In another moment they stood beside someone who was sleeping. Father Roland pointed down and spoke no word. It was a woman. The moonlight fell upon her and shimmered in the thick masses of dark hair that streamed about her, concealing her face. David choked. It was his heart in his throat. He bent down. Gently he lifted the heavy tresses and stared into the sleeping face that was under them, the face of the woman he had met that night on the Transcontinental. Over him he heard a gentle whisper. My wife, David. He staggered back and clutched Father Roland by the shoulders, and his voice was almost sobbing in its excitement as he cried whisperingly, Then you, you are Michael O'Doone, the father of Marge, and Tavish, Tavish. His voice broke. The missioner's face had gone white. They went back into the moonlight again so that they should not awaken the woman. Out there, so close that they seemed to be in each other's arms, the stories were told. David's first, briefly, swiftly, and when Michael O'Doone learned that his daughter was in David's camp, he bowed his face in his hands, and David heard him giving thanks to his God, and then he also told what had happened, briefly too, 
for the minutes of this night were too precious to lose. In his madness, Tavish had believed that his punishment was near, believed that the chance which had taken him so near to the home of the man whose life he had destroyed was his last great warning, and before killing himself, he had written out fully his confession for Michael O'Doon, and had sworn to the innocence of the woman whom he had stolen away. And even as he was destroying himself, God's hand was guiding my Margaret to me, explained the missioner. All those years she had been seeking for me, and at last she learned at Nelson House about Father Roland, whose real name no man knew, and at almost that same time at La Paz there came to her the photograph you found on the train, with a letter saying our little girl was alive at this place you call the Nest. Hawk's wife sent the letter and picture to the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, and it was sent from inspector to inspector until it found her at La Paz. She came to the chateau. We were gone with you. She followed, and we met as Matusin and I were returning. We did not go back to the chateau. We turned about and followed your trail to seek our daughter, and now, out of the shadow of the trees, there broke upon them suddenly the anxious voice of the woman. Napeo, where are you? Dear God, it's the old sweet name she called me so many years ago, whispered Michael O'Doon. She is awake. Come. David held him back a moment. I will go to Marge, he said quickly. I will wake her. And you, bring her mother. Understand, dear father, bring her up there where Marge is sleeping. The voice came again. Napeo, Napeo. I am coming, I am coming, cried the missioner. He turned to David. Yes, I will bring her up there to your camp. And as David hurried away, he heard the sweet voice saying, You must not leave me alone, Napeo. Never, 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 so long as we live. On his knees beside the girl, David waited many minutes while he gained his breath. With his two hands he crumpled her hair, and then after a little he kissed her mouth. And then her eyes, and she moved, and he caught the sleepy whisper of his name. Wake, he cried softly, wake, little comrade. Her arms rose up out of her dream of him and encircled his neck. Sequawin, she murmured, is it morning? He gathered her in his arms. Yes, a glorious day, little comrade. Wake. End of chapter 27 and end of The Courage of Marjo Doon by James Oliver Curwood.